In the Beginning by E. E. Calloway. Dedication to Mr. and Mrs. Everett P. Larsh and the millions of young people who, I trust, will find in the facts herein set forth a sincere belief in God, in the Bible as his greatest inspiration to man, and in Christ as man's greatest hope. Forward. I wish it definitely understood that I do not own or have any financial or material interest whatever in a foot of land between Bristol and Chattahoochee, Florida, within which area the Garden of Eden is located. This volume represents over 60 years of earnest study and research. Here I set forth indisputable facts arrived at the use of the scientific principles of teleology and relativity. Was man created, or did he evolve? These questions have interested and perplexed the minds of millions of people, and will no doubt continue to do so. The purpose and motive of this study, and the research which I have done, which resulted in this brief, was my own satisfaction as to the truth of this matter. I decided that I could not devote my time and effort to any greater use than to establish, once and for all time, as to whether or not there was intelligent purpose motivating man's appearance on this earth, or, if out of blind matter, in blind space, during limitless time, without intelligence of purpose, he evolved. E. E. Calloway Preface The invitation to write the preface to this book first leads to acknowledging the ability of the author. E. E. Calloway, as a theologian, which qualifies him to delve into the field of archaeology, added to his activity as a lawyer and a judge, undoubtedly explains the skillful and logical presentation of facts. Chapter 1. Eden and Garden of Eden The Bible does not specifically tell us where Eden and the Garden of Eden were located, or where Adam and Eve were created, or where Noah made the ark. But it has been generally accepted that the Garden of Eden was originally in Asia, possibly Armenia, and that Noah made the ark there. No one, however, can give facts in support of such a theory, except that there is a river called Euphrates on the present map of Asia. Eden means a place of delight. It suggests a choicest of all earthly places which could be inhabited by human beings. In considering the relations that constitute such a place, especially before the industrial and commercial age, we have not only to consider the physical land area, but those other relations which make possible the living together of people in a peaceful, happy, prosperous, healthy, hopeful, and developing state. This can be done only by the principles of teleology and relativity. I propose to show by the Bible and by other unimpeachable scientific, historical, and secular facts, not only that man was created, but that the Garden of Eden was not in Asia, and that Noah did not build the ark there, that man was created, and that the Garden was and is a fact, and was and is located between Bristol and Chattahoochee, Florida, where the ark was made. It has been believed for centuries that the Garden was in Asia and that Noah built the ark there, solely because the Bible relates, and legend tells us, that the ark landed on Mount Ararat in Armenia, and because of a river named Euphrates. The Bible gives us certain definite facts, corroborated by nature, science, and other unimpeachable evidence, which conclusively prove that the Garden of Eden 
was located east of the Apalachicola River between Bristol and Chattahoochee in Liberty and Gadsden counties, Florida. In the eighth verse of the second chapter of Genesis, the Bible says, The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. Eden originally consisted of South Georgia and South Alabama lying east of the Alabama River, and that part of West Florida, lying between the Alabama line on the west and the Ochilochne River on the east. What is now known as the Fall Line of Georgia and Alabama was the northern boundary of Eden. By use of the science of technology in interpreting certain Bible truths and many other corroborating facts, we are enabled to locate Eden and to point out the place of creation and the Garden of Eden. Chapter 2 Field Notes in the Bible When the U.S. engineers surveyed the public lands, they tied surveys and the boundaries of the land to natural monuments so that future engineers could accurately survey said lands and indisputably locate boundaries. To do this, they made notes in the field, while the surveys were being made, of such natural monuments as trees, stumps, rocks, springs, streams, etc. Those field notes were filed in the land office, and when an engineer is now engaged to survey a tract of land, the first thing that he does is to get a copy of the field notes made by the original engineers. If a surveyor or an engineer can dig out the natural monuments mentioned in the notes, his survey is accepted. The Bible constitutes the field notes of the natural monuments related to the original Garden of Eden. Many of those natural monuments are the River of Four Heads, the naming and the numbering of the four river heads, the gold and the quality of the gold, Genesis chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, the bdellium and onyx stone in the land compassed by the first, or Pison River, the large variety of trees, every tree pleasant to the sight, the gopher wood trees, the fossilized bones of all animals, and the giants. Names of rivers and places could be transplanted from here to Europe, Asia, and Africa, but not the natural monuments. By uncovering these natural monuments, I have definitively located the original Garden of Eden. The Bible, or field notes, of the natural monuments were not written for thousands of years after creation. And the natural question is, how did the author of Genesis know to describe so accurately the natural monuments that are related to the garden? There are only two ways that he could have known. He would have had to have been told by divine intelligence, or such information would have had to have been communicated to him by word of mouth, from generation to generation, down through the files of time. Possibly, he learned of them in both ways. St. Luke, first chapter, first and second verses, tells us of one way. Personally, I believe that he was also divinely informed. At any rate, I have proven the accuracy of the biblical description of those natural monuments by pointing them out for the world to look at. And I was chosen, ordained, and directed to do this by divine intelligence. Until someone points out that these natural monuments are somewhere else on earth, fair-minded, impartial persons cannot deny that the original Garden of Eden was a fact, and that it was located in the Apalachicola Valley of West Florida. It will be noted in passing that all boundaries of all continents, countries, and states have been related 
to permanent natural monuments wherever possible. Man resorts to secondary, man-made monuments for the establishment of boundary lines only when natural monuments are not available. To illustrate the confused thinking on the subject, we have to turn only to the Encyclopedia Britannica, 1947 edition, as an illustration, where is stated in Volume 7, page 948, under the subject of Eden, quote, Many speculations have been made as to the site of the garden, which seems to be thought of as an oasis in a barren region. According to Genesis, it was eastward. Verses 10 through 14 describe a river flowing forth from it and dividing into four streams. Authors note, Britannica did not state four heads, as does the Bible. One of these is the Euphrates, another the Heidekel, almost certainly the Tigris. This would suggest a site north of Babylon. It is true that the Euphrates and the Tigris near Baghdad approach so closely together that the former discharges water through canals into the latter. But if be supposed that these two rivers might be regarded as coming from a common source, no satisfactory explanation of the two remaining rivers is offered. To define the site from these details is impossible. Authors note, and we agree. The attempt to locate a mythological garden is bound to be attended by considerable difficulty, and all that can be safely said is that the story in its present form combines two traditions, one of which places the garden in the Far East, the other in the Far North. Britannica should apologize for such an absurd and false interpretation. Why did it overlook Pison and Gihon? Christians and Jews cannot agree that it was a mythological garden. The confused thinking is of the secular world relative to the garden, its location, and of the first parents therein, has resulted from the fact that the biblical account thereof can be rightfully interpreted only by the use of the scientific principles of teleology and relativity. Unless one understands these principles, he has difficulty in arriving at the facts. The very meaning of teleology is the science of arriving at the truth of any one thing by its complete harmonious relation of other things. Aristotle recognized this fundamental law in his four causes, and so did Descartes. A Christian church minister criticized me because I said that I understood the science of teleology and relativity. Evidently, he had not learned of those principles. He overlooked the truth that, quote, many are called, but few are chosen, for some special task. There is no other area on earth when one considers Eden in Florida, of like size, better blessed with a water supply of pure water. There is no other area on earth of like size, having a better 12-month climate. There is no other area on earth of like size, which will produce such a large variety of agricultural and horticultural products of high quality. There is no other area on earth of like size, which offers larger opportunities. So we know, beyond contradiction, that all of the relations that make possible the living together of people in a peaceful, happy, prosperous, and hopeful condition existed within this area. Remember that these relations are, quote, teleosis relations, and they definitely prove a fact. These facts, that no one ever starved to death, and no one ever was killed by a storm here in the garden, sets it apart as a peculiar place. God sends the winds and the floods. Chapter 3. Flora of Garden Further considering the relations, 
the ninth verse, second chapter of Genesis, says that, quote, Out of the ground, in the garden, made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight. About four miles north of Bristol, in Liberty County, Florida, is an area where this is literally true. In 1821, the botanists of New York, having heard of the large variety of tree life that grows in the Apalachicola Valley of West Florida, sent young Dr. John Torea of New York into this valley to study its tree life. He not only found the renown of the area for its large variety of trees to be true, he also found the original gopher wood trees here. Other botanists named it the Terea taxifolia in honor of Dr. Terea. Eight years ago, two of the nation's greatest botanists spent the day with me in the Garden of Eden, north of Bristol, Liberty County, Florida. They had with them a variety of books describing the trees of the world, and during the late afternoon, one said to the other, quote, I have visited the forest lands of the world, and it is my opinion that here is the largest variety of trees of any spot on earth. End quote. The other agreed. Paul Thompson, a staff writer for the Orlando, Florida Sentinel, called Dr. Louis T. Nyland of the Farm and Forestry Department of the University of Florida for information concerning the gopher trees, and Dr. Nyland's reply, published in the magazine section of the Florida Sentinel of Orlando, Florida, Sunday, December 7, 1952, states, quote, The wood in question is unique. So far as is known, it grows only on the east bank of the Apalachicola River, in a small area near Bristol, Florida. There are related species to be found in China and Northern California, but botanists know of no similar wood anywhere else in the world." End quote. We are told in the sixth chapter of Genesis that gopher wood was the wood which God selected and directed Noah to build the ark. A certain Sunday school teacher asked me to show him an apple tree, and I replied, Apple or apples are not mentioned in Genesis, but I can show you apple trees there. End quote. The following trees are mentioned in the Bible. Almond, Alnug, Aloes, Apple, Ash, Bay, Box, Cedar, Chestnut, Elm, Fig, Fir, Hazel, Juniper, Baca or Mulberry, Myrrh, Myrtle, Palm, Pine, Pomegranate, Poplar, Shitta, Sycamore, Teal, and Willow. Ash, Bay, Box, Cedar, Chestnut, Fig, Fir, Hazel, Juniper, Mulberry, Myrrh, Myrtle, most of the oaks, palm, various types of pine, pomegranate, poplar, shitta, sycamore, and willow are all found in the garden in abundance. Century Dictionary says that aloes and alnug are unidentified Bible trees, but they are not unidentified in the Garden of Eden. Of the 28 trees mentioned in the Bible, 25 of them can be easily identified as growing in the Garden of Eden at this time, the largest number growing any there. Century Dictionary says that gopher wood is an unidentified Bible tree, but it says that Noah built the ark out of it. How do we know that it is the gopher tree mentioned in the Bible? From the teleosis proportionals of the design of its leaves, the grain of its wood, its strength and weight. Two years ago we dug out of the ground, in the garden, three logs of petrified gopher wood, about twenty inches in diameter, 
and six feet long. The ends had been sawed smoothly, as if by a chainsaw. They were cast off from the building of the ark. There are three witnesses to these facts. John V. Fasson, Bud McDaniel of Bristol, Florida, and myself. My son has one of the logs in his shop at Ocala, Florida. Chapter 4, Tree of Life In Genesis chapter 2, verse 9, we are told the Lord God made to grow out of the ground, quote, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, end quote. This statement has puzzled biblical and secular scholars through the centuries. They have been unable to bring themselves to believe that the tree of life grew in the garden and bore fruit, and if one should eat thereof, he would live forever. The confusion relative to this tree of life results from the fact that people have had the wrong conception as to the true nature and character of God. The average person, even the average Christian, conceives of God to be like a man in a physical sense, because the 26th verse of first chapter of Genesis says, quote, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, end quote. They confuse the first and second creations of people. They like to think of God as being a physical person, in the form and shape of a physical man. This conception of God has resulted in all of the racial prejudices the world has ever known, and it has given birth to many of the other prejudices with which the world has been and is cursed. In order clearly to understand the meaning of the tree of life, we must understand precisely what God really is. When Christ was talking to the woman at the well, he said, God is spirit, and of course, spirit is law. In other words, God is law. What kind of law? Firstly, the law of energy. Secondly, the law of life. Third, the law of intelligence. And fourth, the law of love. In the 26th verse of the first chapter of Genesis, this statement appears, quote, God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. End quote. What is the meaning of let us? What is meant by us? It means and does not mean anything except that God is a combination of four great, basic, fundamental laws. The law of energy, the law of life, the law of intelligence, and the law of love. Let us means the plural or the unity of these great inexorable laws. In the 27th verse of the first chapter of Genesis, we find that these great fundamental laws are grouped as one entity in the statement, quote, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. End quote. Like the word family, which means all of the members of the family, without naming the separate members, the common accepted word God means the basic laws which constitute God. The constituent laws which constitute God are energy, life, intelligence, and love. Teleology proves this conclusively. If any of these basic laws were eliminated, there would not be any God. No one denies that there are basic laws of energy, of life, and of love, and only a madman would deny that there is a basic law of intelligence. We see intelligence manifested in so many and marvelous ways that the law is self-evident. It is the law of intelligence that constitutes the Godhead. I am not speaking of the Holy Trinity, which came into manifestation with Christ. The great Albert Einstein felt that, quote, beyond the range of the vision of my mind to comprehend 
there is unlimited intelligence, end quote. Now let's see if the Bible conclusively proves this. Pause. I, the narrator, will be skipping the biblical citations for the following section, for the sake of brevity. We resume. Firstly, the law of energy. Energy is power. The power of God is manifested through all his many attributes. His power was manifested in the creation. So God is power, energy. Secondly, life. God is the author and preserver of all life. Thirdly, intelligence. Intelligence is consciousness, knowledge, wisdom, and will. Consciousness is the hearing ear and the seeing eye. God's knowledge is infinite and eternal. The Lord is a God of knowledge. His eye seeth everything. Wisdom proceeds from God. The will of God is supreme. All things are contingent upon it. The will of man is subject to the will of God and activated by God. Do we need any further proof that there is a law of intelligence? Fourthly, love. God is love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Bob Ingersoll said, In spite of our doubts and fears, love can hear. So, in a plural sense, God is a combination or a unity of the laws of energy, power, life, intelligence, consciousness, knowledge, wisdom, and will, and love. This is the meaning of Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, which says, quote, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. In the eighth verse of the second chapter of Genesis is related, quote, Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. The word Lord used here, as it is used in most places in the Bible, is an adjective to describe the combination or unity of the four basic laws which are God and which brought into play and was used in the forming of man and in giving him life and a soul. This is the God mentioned in Exodus, chapter 3, verse 14. God is defined clearly in the statement, quote, I am that I am, end quote. In the beginning, God, the four basic laws, working in unison, created the heavens and the earth, end quote. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. One of the greatest if not the greatest traveling minister, said in one of his sermons in Miami last winter, quote, I know that there is a God. I cannot define God, but I know that he exists. End quote. When he said that, I could see the expression of disappointment on the faces of thousands of people who had gone to hear him, hoping that he could give them some light on the subject of God. He asked the people to believe in something, yet he said that he could not define that something. It is no wonder that the world is drifting away from Christianity when its greatest apostles cannot or else do not clearly define to the great people what God is. Modern education and science have driven the spooks from the churches, and church leadership has been trying to hold the churches together with social programs. To keep the show going, they have fallen into commercial temptation. When church revenues were related to the taxpayer's income, through the internal revenue laws, the Spirit of God left organized Christianity. I have known a number of men who said that they were atheist. Every one of them claimed to be an atheist because he said that he could not bring himself to believe that God is a being a word implying man, or something in the shape or form of a man. 
For many years I have enjoyed the friendship of the late Clarence Darrow. I was with him frequently while he was trying the, quote, monkey case in Tennessee. He could not bring himself to believe in a supreme being, medicine man, so to speak. But when we discussed God as being a combination of the supreme laws of energy, of life, of intelligence, and of love, he remarked, that is something else. He believed in a law of intelligence, as well as in the other basic laws. If we eliminate intelligence, we eliminate God. We have only materialism left. If we include intelligence as a basic and fundamental law, then we include purpose. A Mennonite friend of mine, while we were discussing this subject, asked, Where is God's headquarters if, as you say, God is law? My answer was, and is, law does not have any headquarters. It is infinite, universal, everywhere, omnipresent. I am a God at hand, and not a God far off. The Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Revelations chapter 19, verse 6. God is invisible because law is invisible. Like the wind, you can feel it and see its results, but you cannot see from whence it came, nor whither it goeth. Quote, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. Exodus chapter 33, verse 20. After many long years of study and reflection, and after having learned the scientific principles of teleology, of interpretation, and carefully observing the reactions and responses of the Christian world, within and without the various denominations, and especially among educated and political leaders, I have come to know that the reason the Church is not a more effective force and influence in the world today is because so many do not have a clear conception or understanding of just what God is. When the chosen people of the earth, the Israelites, started on their great journey from bondage, or adverse condition, to the promised land, or favorable condition, Moses, who had been specially chosen to lead them, took particular pains to explain to them just what God is and his great purposes. A careful study of the history of that great journey will show that Moses, and later his successor, Joshua, often and repeatedly redefined to them just what God is, and his great promise. Many so-called Christians, and in fact many church members, have about the same conception of God that many children have of Santa Claus. They think of him a white-haired, long-whiskered old gentleman coming in around at Christmas time distributing presents. Many church members are unable to define definitely what God is, but they have a notion or conception of God as some kind of a large personage in the physical shape and form of a man. And like the child, as their minds develop, and they are no longer able really to believe in such a personage, they throw overboard completely a belief in God, or they go through life still hoping that it is true, but doubtful. If they continue to cling to the belief, they do so, more or less, as a means of escape from what which they realize is inevitable. The church leadership is responsible for such doubt and confusion by not clearly and repeatedly teaching the people that God is fundamental law, the keystone of which is intelligence, manifesting purpose. I once knew a family composed of father, mother, and four bright children, the oldest of whom was a daughter about twelve years old, and the youngest of whom, a little boy, was about five. They had all been taught by their parents that there is a Santa Claus, and every Christmas they had seen Santa Claus on the streets in the city where they lived. The oldest of the children had heard from the street mongers that, quote, 
There is not any Santa Claus. Mama and Daddy are Santa Claus. And they conveyed such information to the youngest boy. He insisted that there is a Santa Claus, but they denied it. He finally went to his mother and told her what his sister and brothers had said. And he wanted her to confirm what she had told him, that there is a Santa Claus. She decided that since his older sister and brothers had so informed him that she, too, had better tell him the truth. She tried to impress upon him the beauty of the ideal of Santa Claus, but the little boy's mind was unable to grasp her meaning. He sat down in a chair in the living room in deep grief and reflection, and as the tears of disappointment flowed, because his mother, in whom he had the greatest confidence, had confirmed what his older sister and brothers had told him, he lifted his eyes to his mother and asked, quote, Now since you admit that there is no Santa Claus, is this God story you've been telling me the same kind of lie? End quote. Vast millions of so-called Christians, as they evolve from intellectual fantasy, are unable to grasp the teaching of church leadership, and when they can no longer believe in God as some superman, they throw over entirely the great job of knowing just what God is, or else they go through life in confusion and doubt, often becoming avowed agnostics. The Bible says that, quote, By their fruit ye shall know them. It would seem that if the Christian leaders of organized religions were to stop and reflect upon the fruit they have borne, they would wish to do something different than they have been doing. Notwithstanding the increase of the material agencies with which they have had at their command, we find the Western world in such deplorable condition today that almost one half of the earnings of its people are being used to develop more efficient means with which to destroy mankind. Christians offer an excuse that they have to do it to keep the communists from destroying us. We have not yet been willing to admit that the failure of organized religion made possible the seedbed in which communism could take root and flourish. The racial strife with which our country is now afflicted was made possible because of the miserable failure of organized religion. Most of those who brought the black man here from Africa, and most of those who brought them and used them as slaves, northern and southern, were church leaders. The whole of Latin America is more a cesspool of intrigue and confusion today than anywhere else in the world because of the miserable failure of organized religion. And in Europe and in South America, where vast expenditures have been made, there is more hate and prejudice and a greater burden placed upon the people in order to develop better means of destruction than has been known in all the rest of the world during the entire history of man. Chapter 5. Miracles A very fine friend of mine said to me, quote, In order to believe that the Bible account of creation, and of the flood, and the ark, and even Christ, you would have to believe in miracles, and to me, miracles are preposterous. End quote. And then I said to him, Do you think that anything can be preposterous if it has a coordinated and harmonious working of unlimited power, energy, life, love, and intelligence? If this combination is unlimited and is directed by intelligent purpose, do you think that it can be preposterous? Because something appears preposterous to you, it does not mean that it is preposterous with God. But I say that it is impossible to account for the origin of life on any theory that excludes intelligent purpose. The evidence of creation is too convincing to be denied. When you ponder the anatomy of the eye and its relation to the rest of the body, and the fact that a five-year-old child can focus his eyes on an object and make a picture of it, file it away in his mind, and 80 years later reach up, recall it, look at it, 
and discuss it, you get a slight hint of the power of God. It appears to be a miracle. Only intelligence could have designed it. When you understand the principles and science of teleology, by which man is designed and built, it loses its aspects as a miracle. Even a slight review of the history of man will conclusively prove that the tree of life is individual freedom, the sole power of choice of the individual. During the thousands of years in history known as the Dark Ages, when authority denied and tried to destroy the liberty of individual, there was not one good book written or one great invention, and two-thirds of the great inventions of all time were the accomplishments of individuals in those countries which recognized the productivity of this tree and made it their first business to protect it. Since Thomas Jefferson declared in the immortal declaration that it is a creator-given, inalienable right, and we adopted a system of government to protect it and guard it, Americans, though representing only 7% of the world's population and living on only 6% of the Earth's area, have made the greatest progress of any people in all history. This tree of life, individual liberty, has borne not only for us Americans, but for mankind everywhere, the greatest material and spiritual fruit ever known to man under any other system or any other philosophy. It has borne for us such production that we have come so near solving the problems of production, and we hardly know what to do with it. It has borne for us over half of the world's wealth, and has made it possible for us to have invested twice as much as the rest of the world in education and religion. It is a creative tree. It means life more abundantly. Even though Adam and Eve ate the fruit of the tree of knowledge, God was not willing to take their liberty away from them. And we are told in the 24th verse of the third chapter of Genesis that he regarded it of such priceless value that he placed cherubims, guards, and a flaming sword turning in every direction to protect it. He did not place those guards and the sword at the east of the garden to keep people out of the garden, but he placed them there, quote, to protect the way of the tree of life, which is liberty and freedom of the individual. And wherever and whenever misguided fanatics seek to destroy the tree of life, liberty, the guards will be found on duty, as well as the sword that, quote, turns every way will be there to protect that tree, liberty. Foolish indeed are the communists, to believe that they can destroy the liberty, or the individual, the tree of life. Chapter 6. Two Great Principles In 1776, a group of Americans met in convention, and after weeks of prayerful debate and deliberation, adopted a great declaration of principles, known as the Declaration of Independence, in which they declared to a candid world, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among those are, quote, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In other words, they declared that God is the author and the giver of the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In 1789, a group of Frenchmen met in convention, and after weeks of debate and deliberation, issued another great declaration of principles known as the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of Citizens. The French Declaration did not recognize God as being the author and the giver of inalienable rights to the individual, but to the contrary stated that, quote, the state is the source of all authority, and that no man or group of men 
have any rights or authority that are not derived from it. End quote. Both of these declarations of principles came at about the same time in human history, and both evolved from the same background of tyranny, oppression, confusion, and chaos. France was already a powerful country at the time its declaration was issued. The United States of America was a new country with a very limited population at the time the Declaration of Independence was issued. The people of both countries started out under these separate declarations, and for 150 years there was no one in this country to deny or challenge the God-endowed rights of man. Such a philosophy was accepted universally. It was taught, believed, and adhered to by the people everywhere. It was taught in the classroom, preached from the pulpit, observed in the halls of legislation, and repeatedly respected, upheld, and confirmed by judicial mandate and decree. It can be said without fear of responsible contradiction that, during those 150 years, Americans made the greatest intellectual, spiritual, and material progress ever made by any people in human history. Because of the French philosophy that the state, and not God, is the author and giver of all rights, France was constantly and repeatedly in turmoil and strife, engaged in domestic and foreign quarrels and wars, all of which finally led to World War I. During World War I, the radicals of Europe, those who believed in the authority of the state as being supreme, realized that they could not resist the power of men who believed in God, in God-endowed liberty, and in the sacredness of their homes. They realized that such men were not content to remain in the lice-infested trenches of Europe, and at the conclusion of this great war, a great conspiracy was born in Europe to destroy that belief in America and thereby control the world. That conspiracy had three objectives. First, to bring about a revolution in Russia and have the communists take control there. Second, to infiltrate the American colleges and universities with atheists, communists, and radicals to destroy our belief in God, and in God-endowed liberty of the individual. They chose this area because they knew of our great desire to educate our children, and that we would appropriate billions of dollars of taxpayers' money to further this desire, and because they know too that under our Constitution, the Church could not fight back behind an iron curtain. The third purpose of that conspiracy was to draw from deposits in this country all the gold which Europeans had here on deposit, thereby bringing about such financial and economic chaos in this country that the American people would be willing to accept any kind of scheme or panacea in order to survive. Let it be noted that such conspirators planned well having ably executed all three aspects of that conspiracy. Russian communism has advanced to where it is a threat to the world today. American colleges and universities have turned out millions of the finest boys and girls in the country who no longer believe in God or in God-endowed inalienable rights of the individual. There was such heavy withdrawal of gold from deposits in this country after the conclusion of World War I that the greatest depression our country has experienced resulted in 1929. Though possessed of the greatest productive capacity any people in history had ever known, millions of our people were on the verge of starvation and were in a frame of mind to embrace any scheme which appeared to bring relief. At the depth of such depression, the Democratic Party met in National Convention in 1932. At the National Convention in 1932, the Democratic Party 
adopted as sound an American platform as was ever adopted by any political party. It reaffirmed our faith in God and in God endowed inalienable rights of man. It specifically promised to reduce the cost of government at least 25%, to encourage rather than restrict production, to abolish bureaus and bureaucrats, and to take the government out of business in competition with private enterprise. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was nominated for president and, in accepting the nomination and in his speeches throughout the campaign, reaffirmed his faith in those principles, and he was elected. But our forefathers, unfortunately, put a joker in the Declaration of Independence when they said that, quote, all just powers of government are derived from the consent of the governed. During the election of 1932, a number of men were elected to Congress who did not believe in God-endowed rights as being paramount to the consent of the governmental authority of the mob. These were willing to go along with Mr. Roosevelt in raping not only the Constitution, but the God-endowed philosophy under which our country had grown great. One of Mr. Roosevelt's first official acts was to create his Blue Eagle, or Blue Buzzard program, which gave the majority the right to run roughshod over the individual and over the minority. The Supreme Court, as then constituted, would not go along with Mr. Roosevelt and his puppet Congress, so he denounced the court as, quote, nine old men, and began to revamp the judiciary so that it would be presided over by men convinced that the consent of the governed philosophy was paramount to the God-endowed rights philosophy. It can be said that the great majority of the men since appointed to the federal judiciary by Roosevelt, Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson have been men of such convictions. That philosophy has been most prominent in all aspects of our national and economic life since then. All farm subsidies and farm legislation have been in accord with that philosophy, as has all labor legislation. The entire history of man confirms that such a philosophy is revolutionary in spirit and in results, and it has brought us to confusion confounded. Chapter 7 Tree of Knowledge of Good and Evil What is the tree of knowledge of good and evil, spoken of in the ninth verse of the second chapter of Genesis? It is the soul power that enables man to know good from evil in exercising the power of choice that God gave man. Putting in man's power the ability to know good from evil and to respond to the problems of life, whatever they are. It is the power to make the choice even to sacrificing his physical body in order that something better might be produced. To leave the garden and become self-supporting through honest labor, and to stop being dependent physically. The Lord told Adam and Eve that if they ate the fruit of the tree of knowledge, they would surely die. That is, they would die as dependents and become respectful citizens, get off relief, so to speak, and then have the privilege to develop into the image of God. He knew that they would then want to die physically, in order that they might inherit the greater life. They understood what he said unto them. The serpent, which as the most subtle of the beast of the field, he must have been a communist or a welfare statist, but not a snake, as is usually believed, reminded the woman that God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The woman reminded the serpent that she knew that, for she said to the serpent, We may eat freely, Genesis chapter 2, verse 16, of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, 
ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. End quote. The serpent impressed upon her, Your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as God, knowing good and evil. Woman could not have exemplified her choice to expend herself that something better might be produced down through the ages if Mother Eve had not known that and had not deliberately made that choice to know good from evil, then choosing good. The serpent was the adverse influence which opposed God's supreme law, the God of knowledge, to produce something better. It was that adverse, low influence that tried to persuade Adam and Eve not to make the choice of accepting physical death in order that they might have a part in producing something better. The serpent objected to something better being produced. He still does, and he is subtle about it. Adam and Eve were not deceived. Therefore, in making the choice to accept death of their physical bodies, in producing something better, at least Mother Eve was not deceived. Since they had become living souls, endowed of the power of choice, and had eaten of the fruit, and come to know good from evil, they deliberately chose to come under the law that ultimately meant the suffering and the death of their physical bodies, in order that they might have a part in the production of something better. I am glad that she ate it, and that she insisted upon Adam eating it as well. I am glad American Eves have insisted on their husbands and sons eating it ever since. Then to compensate Mother Eve for her marvelous choice, God, through woman, set up a plan whereby everyone may use his liberty and regain eternal life. He sent his son into the world to provide this plan. Chapter 8 Mother Eve's Great Decision All my life I have heard some ministers and Sunday school teachers criticize and castigate Mother Eve for her decision to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Every intelligent woman on earth, as well as every intelligent man, should refute that criticism. At the very beginning, of the creation of the Adamic man. God gave him liberty, or the power of choice. God created Mother Eve from Adam that she might be his exact equal in the right of liberty and in the responsibility for its correct use. Since there is not an intelligent woman on earth of any race or creed who will deny this right or this responsibility, it must be accepted as being true. The greatest gift which God gave the Adamic man was the gift of liberty, as well as the responsibility for its use. This gift alone raises man above the level of the beast. In the sixteenth verse of the second chapter of Genesis, God said to the Adamic man, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Nothing could be plainer than this. But in the seventeenth verse of the same chapter of Genesis, God informed the Adamic man that if he ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, he would die. Mother Eve therefore had to decide whether she wished to live forever on a level of the beast or that of a totally insane person, with her descendants living forever on the same level, not knowing good from evil, right from wrong or whether she desired for herself and her posterity to know right from wrong and good from evil, and then to die. She had to make the greatest decision any human being has ever had to make, or ever will have to make. I bless her for having made that great decision. If I had to make such a decision, I would gladly make the same decision she made. I have often heard it preached that we are all born in sin, natural crooks. 
The Bible does not teach any such thing, and it is a slander of God to teach any such doctrine. The only sin into which man is born is the sin of ignorance, but man is equally rewarded by the fact that he is born with the capacity to develop so that he can know right from wrong, good from evil. God provided such a plan, and Mother Eve, by her great decision, put such a plan into execution. God could have provided a different plan, and he could have put a different plan into execution, but if he had done so, he would have taken the most interesting thing of life away from man, and left him on a parity with the beast. Man is ever presented with the opportunity to continue to develop his capacity to know good from evil during the changing vicissitudes of time and circumstances. This is what gives zest to life. The manner in which we meet this challenge determines our relationship to and our image of God. I have heard many ministers discuss the subject of the unpardonable sin. Most of them regarded it as unbelief, which, to me, cannot be true. The unpardonable sin, spoken of in the Bible, is our failure to use every moment allotted to us and to develop our minds into a better understanding of what is good and what is evil, and our failure to help in the production of something better. Those who think they can fritter away their allotted time and talents, wherever they are in this life, and then have God endow them with all the happiness and blessings in another life, will be woefully disappointed. Upon the altar of eternity, we must lay the fruits of our accomplishments in this life. Man is certainly immortal through his progeny and through the influences which he sets in motion, whether they be good or bad. Chapter 9 Two Creations of People According to the teleological interpretation of the Bible, which is the correct interpretation, there were two creations of people. God first created male and female, Genesis chapter 1 verse 27, but he did not give them a soul, the power of choice. They had no more power of choice than the other animals. They did not know good from evil. They lived on the earth for ages before the second creation, when Adam and Eve were created and given a soul. They multiplied throughout the earth, but they were all destroyed by the flood. They were created by the four fundamental laws of energy, life, intelligence, and love. For Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 says, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. They were not, however, given a soul. The creation of male and female completed the six days of creation during the first period, and then God rested on the seventh day. Quote, From all his work which God created and made, Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 through 3, the male and female people who were created during the first period were not created in the Garden of Eden, and were never in the Garden of Eden. They were created in the Appalachian area of the United States because all informed geologists admit that it is the oldest landmass on earth. When God divided the waters, the Appalachian region was the first dry land to appear. Here were the giants mentioned in Genesis, chapter 6, verse 4. Their skeletons are only found in the Western Hemisphere, not in Asia. Ages later, the Lord God, meaning the four laws, formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 He was not created in the Garden of Eden. He was created just out of the Garden. 
he was the first man to be given a soul. The power of choice, that was Adam. Then the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Genesis chapter 2 verse 8. Then the Lord God discovered that though the man was actually living in the Garden of Eden, he was lonely by himself. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. Every bachelor I have known was lonely. I will help him a mate. Genesis chapter 2 verse 18 Adam was then in the garden, having been put there, after he was formed and became a living soul. The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon him, using as an anesthesia, hypnotism. What is it? Teleosis. And he operated on him, and took a rib from his side, and made woman. Adam was so greatly pleased with her, that he said, quote, She is bone of my bone, and flesh of my flesh. They were physical people, endowed with a soul power of choice. He created Eve out of Adam's rib, rather than from the dust, that she might be his equal in the right to liberty and responsibility for its use. The days mentioned in the first and second chapters of Genesis do not mean 24 hours, as we understand a day to mean. They mean long periods of time, possibly many thousands of years, as we understand verse. God continued to create during six long periods of time called days. During the first day, or period, God created the heaven and the earth, and he created light. During the second day, or period, he created the firmament. On the third day, God divided the waters and dry land appeared, the Appalachian section of the United States. During this day, or period, he created grass, herbs, and fruit trees, only fruit trees during the first period. During the four-day, or long period, he created the sun, moon, and stars. During the fifth day, or period, he created the fishes and things of the sea and fowls of the air. During the sixth day, or long period of time, God created the beasts, cattle, and creeping things. He also made the people of the first period, or creation, male and female, but only as an image or pattern. Then, he rested on the seventh day, or long period of time. What is meant by, he rested? It simply means that he had not stopped creating, but he rested for a period, and then he created again. To rest does not mean to stop completely, but to suspend work for a time. The seventh day, period, in which God rested, may have lasted ages and ages. Many things happened on the earth during the period that God was resting. The Appalachian Mountains eroded down during this period, and the plains and the valleys were formed. Then God, after he had rested, created again. But he only created three things during the second period of creation. He created Adam and gave him a soul. Then he planted a garden north of what is now Bristol, Florida, and put Adam in it to keep and tend it. In this garden, he caused to grow every tree pleasant to the sight, for he knew the Adamic man would need more than just something to eat. The only trees that he created during the first period of creation were fruit trees. But during the second period of creation, he caused to grow in the garden north of Bristol every tree that is pleasant to the sight. He knew that the Adamic man would need trees for various purposes. Then he created Mother Eve. She was the last and best thing he created. So, man was later excluded from the garden at the East Gate, 
which is one mile north of Bristol. But the woman was not. She may have followed him out, and she has been following him ever since. Genesis chapter 2, verse 23 through 24. After Adam was driven out of the garden, he earned his living by working and died when he was 930 years old and was buried near Bristol. So was Eve. I know the exact spot. God told me. The first male and female made, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, were made only in the image of God, not physical. For God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. An image is a symbol, conception, optical reflection. A symbol is a sign, something that suggests something else. It is only a pattern only in the sense that they were given energy, life, love, and intelligence, were they in the image of God. The animals were not given a soul, as were Adam and Eve, formed of the dust ages and ages later. After Abel was slain by his brother Cain, Adam begat Seth that, quote, Lord might preserve the seed of Abel, and Noah came through the seed of Seth. Cain was a brother of Abel, but Cain's entire seed went up a blind alley and was completely destroyed by the flood, as were all the people made at the first creation. When the Lord God formed Adam of the dust and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and then gave him a living soul, he did not say that he was forming him in his image and according to his likeness. He gave Adam liberty and opportunity to develop himself into the image of God. He did not make a symbol or sign out of Adam. He formed a different man and gave him a soul. And that Adam's seed might have a soul, he made a woman out of Adam's rib. Cain was given a soul power of choice, but he abused it, and chose to be a cheat. As a result, he and his seed were utterly destroyed by the flood. Cain's wife, who was of the land of Nod, was a descendant of the people of the first creation, who did not have a soul, and all of whom perished at the flood. When the scientists dig up the bones of fossilized parts of bone, that are hundreds of thousands of years old, which they call, quote, the missing links. They are very likely digging up the bones of the seed of the first male and female who were created during the first period of creation, but who were not given a soul, as were Adam and Eve. The so-called missing link, which the evolutionists, or some of them, claim to have found in the form of fossilized skulls or bones, and which they claim connect the lower forms of animals with man, are nothing but the fossilized parts of the first creation. They were an entirely separate species from the Adamic man, who was formed and put into the Garden of Eden. We positively know this from the teleosis principles of design and construction. The scientists go wrong because they do not understand these principles. Of course there is, or was a scientific theory that there was no special purposeful creation of any of the species, but that all evolved from a common ancestor, possibly a vegetable algae. It is frequently quoted that, quote, out of matter, in space, during time, was evolved all that is. The atom was thought to be the smallest unit of matter. Since we have looked inside of the atom, and found that it is not matter, but energy, the boys have had to look for other theories. They now say, quote, Evolution and the diversity we see are due to the action in the part of natural causes. Then they try to enlighten us by saying, It is now universally held by competent biologists that all organisms, living or extinct, have arisen from remote common ancestors, and that in all probability, the remote ancestors arose from non-living matter. 
They rest on probability when it comes to the origin of ancestors. In their discussion of the first steps in evolution, they say, quote, Although we are ignorant of the origin of life, we may suggest that we may have been the first steps in evolution. There must have been a time when protoplasm first appeared. It must be supposed that long ago, when conditions became favorable, compounds were formed. Britannica 8, page 918. We may sift the evolutionary theory from Genesis to Revelation through Larmark, Darwin, Ray, Linnaeus, Spencer, Hackel, Lewis, and others, and we find the same probability, or must assume, as the basis on which they ask us to believe. There was no intelligent purpose in the creation of the species. So long as we absolutely know that there is intelligent design in the formation of every snowflake, and that no two are alike. So long as of all the people who live on this earth, no two will have the same fingerprints or the same personality. So long shall I know that there was and is intelligent purpose back of all creation. The Piltdown Man, whom the so-called, quote, world's most famous anthropologists claimed for over 40 years was the real missing link, has been proven to be a hoax and a fraud. Those world-famous anthropologists have now fallen back on the Java man as the missing link. They have also begun to mention again the Pekin men, and Bloom's South African man, and the Rhodesian man. We know positively from the teleosis that they are all frauds of the first water. They were of the first creation, and did not have a soul. They were only images of the Adamic man, who was given a soul. Thirty years ago, there was a great battle of wits in Tennessee, between Darrow and Brian, over the theory of creation. Darrow contended for the evolutionist theory, and Brian for the biblical account of purposeful creation. Evolution won the battle, but it did not win the war. It will never win the war. Charles Darwin started a violent battle between religion and science. Darwin believed that evolution was a more plausible theory than the Bible story of purposeful creation. But neither Darwin nor any scientist since then has been able to prove it. Artificial breeding of plants, animals, with its ability to produce numberless rapid changes and improvements has never been able to evolve a new kind of animal or plant, only a variation of existing types. Attempts to crossbreed different forms of life produce nothing. Darwin believed that man, the most complex animal on earth, must have evolved over billions of years from an original one-celled animal. One of Darwin's strongest arguments was the fact that human beings themselves are conceived by the joining of two single cells, the ovum and sperm, which multiply until birth, when they have resulted in a fully formed child. Another argument was that the deeper geologists dig down through the earth, the more simple are the forms of life whose fossils remains they find. Darwin notes that the creatures now living on Earth range all the way from one-celled animals to man, presenting a continuous panorama which, for him, suggested the descent of man. From these three facts, Darwin arrived at his theory of evolution. This Darwinism theory met with violent opposition at first from the church. Then man began to make marvelous discoveries both in the chemical and the mechanical fields, which were wholly disconnected with the theory of evolution. Man began unconsciously to associate all scientific progress with the theory of evolution. As a result, the vast majority of people, except the scientists themselves, claim to believe in evolution. The scientists have never accepted it. They are still looking for the proof. 
This fact alone conclusively shows that they do not regard it as fact. It has been my observation that the vast majority of the people who do accept evolution as a fact know practically nothing about either evolution or the Bible. So evolution is still nothing more than an unproven theory among the scientists. Christians should encourage the scientists to continue to look for the proof. Darwin, in trying to account for progressive changes, hit upon the idea of, quote, the survival of the fittest. He explained that this accounted for the speed and coloring of the zebras and the tough hides of the hippopotamuses, but he failed to explain why these two different animals live side by side and do not cross. Both were fit to survive. And so is man, and so are the one-celled animals who continue to exist all over the world. Men do not seem to be more fit to survive than many other of the animal species. Darwin was never able to explain why a one-celled form of life could create more complex ones leading to man. Without this proof, the whole theory of evolution collapses. The scientists are working hard today to discover the proof of evolution, which Darwin himself could never prove. It has not been proven. It cannot be proven, because it is not true. But those who love the truth should encourage them to keep on trying. Chapter 10 Atheism and Communism The Christian and civilized world is seriously alarmed over communism and its barbarities. Communism is only atheism in action. The source of intelligence, justice, love, and mercy is God. And when God is excluded, law is excluded. Before Marx, Lenin, and Stalin could become communists, they had first to become atheists. The fruit of atheism-communism is manifested through the Soviet sphere of influence. The brutalities perpetrated by the communists on prisoners and civilians in Russia, China, Cuba, and Korea, as testified to before congressional committees and the United Nations, were but atheism in action. Those who believe in Christ and in the democratic process could not have done such things. Christianity and the democratic principle are based upon the fundamental concept of creator-endowed, unalienable rights of choice and responsibility of the individual. Atheism denies such a creator. It therefore denies such unalienable rights of the individual. Communism denies the same thing. I have known a few communists, and every one was an atheist who had been infected with that deadly virus while studying biology in his elementary, high school, and college days. Atheism, denying the existence of God, denies the inspiration of the Bible as the word of God. So does communism. Yet, Christians and democratic parents in America are unsuspectingly permitting their young children to be taught in their school years through textbooks and encyclopedias on biology, that, quote, it is impossible to account for their existence on any theory of special creation. See Britannica, Volume 8, page 916. Of course, the child is not told by the teacher in plain words that there is not any God. The teacher would be run out of the schoolroom if she did that. But in teaching biology, she leads the child by implication, step by step, to believe that he is the product of evolution. The children are taught by their parents to love, respect, and listen to their teacher. Parents are taxing themselves millions of dollars for the purchase of textbooks on biology and encyclopedias that contain such ideas. They are taxing themselves hundreds of millions of dollars to pay teachers who, parrot-like, teach such theories. Then we are shocked to hear 
or read that juvenile delinquency has become one of the serious problems in the cities of the nation. We cannot indoctrinate the children of this country by expressed or implied teachings with the idea that there is not any God or intelligent purpose back of their lives, and that they are the ultimate product of blind evolution, without destroying the very moral fiber on which civilization is based. The so-called intelligentsia of this country cast slurs upon William Jennings Bryan when he predicted 35 years ago just what would happen if we did not discontinue such teachings to the young children of this country. As a result of ignoring his warning, we now see the penitentiaries of this country crowded with the young people who are the victims of that philosophy. We see the highest councils of our government putrefied by crooks, frauds, spies, and traitors who subscribe to the same philosophy. This is the same thinking which results in the textbooks used in our public schools that state that there is not any God back of our creation, but that we are the product of blind evolution and which oppose the teaching of the Bible or the principles of any religion in the public schools. I agree with them that church and state should forever be kept separate and apart, and that the public school is not the forum in which to teach the Bible or some orthodox religion. But I think it more dangerous and infamous to use the public school classroom as a forum in which to destroy the student's belief in God and the Bible. The child's mind is badly disturbed during his elementary and high school years by such teaching. When he enters college, he is a fertile seedbed for indoctrination of atheism and communism by pink-colored theorists and intellectual pygmies, paid large salaries by the very parents whose children they poison with a more destructive virus than polio. Horrible as infantile paralysis is, it only cripples or destroys a child here and there, while this atheistic virus and communistic brutality destroys the soul of the very individual who becomes afflicted by it and digs the pillars out from under Christianity and democracy. The hour is already late for the fathers and mothers of this country and our Christian churches to declare a war on this hellish thing. All of our sacrifices and our efforts against communism will amount to naught unless we eradicate this poisonous virus from the public school rooms of this country. The congressional investigation proves that our school philosophy is wrong. If we are to teach atheism in the schools, then let us give the child in school an opportunity to learn the other side. Chapter 11 Symptoms and Rewards of the Materialists It is easy to point out the symptoms of the materialist. They are doubt, mental confusion, hypertension, nervousness, and the seeking of justification for his assumptions and excessive indulgencies, which he calls luxuries without finding satisfaction in peace. The teenagers who have been taught to exclude God from their lives, we find getting into serious trouble in their own attempts to outwit the police. Alexander the Great followed his ambition for material power until he had conquered the known world and then wept in disappointment because there were no more worlds to conquer. Napoleon the little corporal, also drunk with ambition for material power, was so reckless with human life that on one occasion he wrote his wife that he had lost, quote, only a few thousand men that day, and no one of any importance. At his graveside, Bob Ingersoll said, quote, I had rather have been a French peasant and worn wooden shoes. Solomon tried every material thing which modern man is struggling trying to acquire. Public office, 
the finest, most elegantly furnished house ever built, cattle on a thousand hills, three hundred wives, and seven hundred gold diggers to annoy him, only to realize, finally, that they were, quote, vexation and vanity, and his last request was for, quote, wisdom and an understanding heart. The intellectual titan, Herbert Spencer, used his great mind for fifty years in an effort to solve the riddles of his existence apart from the Bible. But when he came to write his autobiography, on page 549, volume 2, he said, quote, The religious creeds, which in one way or the other occupy the sphere that rational interpretation seeks to occupy and fails, and fails the more it seeks, I have come to regard with a sympathy based on community of need. The famous skeptic W. O. Saunder, writing in the American Magazine for November 1930, on page 23, looking over the whole horizon of materialistic philosophy, said, quote, I would have you meet the lonesomest and most unhappy man on earth, I am talking about the man who does not believe in God. I am peculiarly qualified to introduce the agnostic. I am an agnostic myself. Out of my own mind and my own heart, I write this. You will be surprised to know that the agnostic envies you, your faith in God, your settled belief in heaven after death, and your blessed assurance that you will meet with your loved ones where there will be neither sorrow nor pain. For the agnostic, there is only the grave and the persistence of matter. All he can see beyond the grave is the disintegration of the protoplasm and psychoplasm. In this material view, I find no ecstasy nor happiness." End quote. The greatest of all infidelic orators, standing by the side of his brother's grave, at the moment when the evil of his mind was opened by sorrow, visioned life as, quote, narrow veil between the cold and barren peaks of two eternities. Can you picture a more horrid consciousness? But Christ gave the complete answer to this philosophy when he said to his followers just before leaving this world, quote, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. For when I am there, you may be also. End quote. In this assurance, he converted Ingersoll's quote, cold and barren peaks into a garden of indescribable grandeur and beauty. And in that assurance, he removed from the mind of everyone who believes him all fear of the future. But you may say, I do not believe that Christ knew what he was talking about. Then how do you explain his marvelous life? Born in a manger, in a dirty stable, he was the purest human in all the world. Born of humble, poverty-stricken parents, uneducated, without authority, he commanded no army, held no office, received no honors, wrote no books, and died in early manhood, on the cross between two criminals. He was born at a time when the three greatest powers of the then known earth combined to destroy him, and yet, throughout the world, by phone, radio, rail, foot, horseback, his glory gathers beauty and power. Socrates taught for forty years, Plato for fifty, Aristotle for forty, and Christ only three. Yet the three years in which Christ taught transcend and influence the combined teachings of the three greatest philosophers of all time. How do you account for it? When he commanded, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, he put in motion the power of education. With that command, he chartered the seven seas for navigation surveyed the jungles and laid the cornerstone of every institution of learning on earth. In his admonition, 
quote, Love thy neighbor as thyself. He blueprinted every hospital and asylum. With that command, he established the juvenile court and the parole commissions. That was the preamble which precedes Social Security, old age assistance, unemployment insurance, and workmen's compensation. Christ did not write books, and yet, his words have been quoted more than any author. He did not write music, but Haydn, Handel, Beethoven, Bach, and Mendelssohn reached their highest perfection writing in his praise. He did not draft the plans for any building, and yet the world's most beautiful architectural masterpieces have been erected in his glory. He did not write poetry, but Dante, Milton, and Shakespeare received their inspiration from him. In his command, as ye would that men do unto you, do ye likewise unto them. He codified all laws of human conduct. Upon that command was built the Code of Justinian, the Great Charter of English Liberty, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution of every free government, the Charter of the United Nations, and the decision of the Supreme Court on segregation. I have written the above concerning Christ in order that thinking men and women may weigh for themselves the life and teachings of Jesus Christ, hoping that by doing so they will find in him salvation. The only way any person can hope for salvation is through a sincere belief in Christ. The Bible teaches that, quote, He that believeth in Christ, and is baptized, shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, no one can force himself to believe something that does not satisfy him as true. He can say that he believes to be popular, but that will not save him. It is a true and sincere belief in Christ that brings salvation. In order that belief may be true and sincere, it must be based upon something that convinces the mind. I have set forth the above concerning Christ, that it may be helpful in convincing the honest and sincere person that Christ is the Savior. You may find an abundant proof in his divinity from the Bible itself especially the prophecy of his coming, and the other marvelous things that he did and said, and the love and principles that he lived and taught. But it is by calling the reader's attention to the foregoing facts, which no rational mind can or will deny, I hope to remove doubt in your mind, and trust that you can and will become a true sincere believer in Christ. Now, what say ye of the Christ? Just as the child needs the love, comfort, companionship, and counsel of his earthly father, adult men and women need the love, counsel, help, and advice of God. He speaks to us, if we will but listen, through the Bible, our consciences, and the beauties of nature. Chapter 12 the hope of Christians. The scientists and the evolutionists have directed their research and their efforts only to the genesis of man, his origin, beginning, from whence he came and how he got here. They are not any nearer a solution than they were when they first began, yet they should be encouraged to search for the truth. They now say, that they can name the chemicals and the elements of life, and they have hinted that they can arrange or put together those chemicals and elements in such a way that life will be manifested. They have not yet created any chemicals. They have been so involved trying to solve this question that they have completely ignored the other, most important of all questions, and that is, what is man's ultimate destination? and what the conditions of that destination. On the other hand, the church, particularly the Christian, has in the past and is now interested itself as much or more with the final destiny of man than it has with the genesis of his being. 
One undeniable fact stands out as the keystone of man's intellectual life, and that is that he desires to continue to live. All agree that we of the present are the immortality of our remotest ancestors, and that will be true of each succeeding generation throughout the existence of man on earth. All agree that man has given birth to influences, whether good or bad, but this measure of immortality does not completely satisfy the soul of man. To augment this, throughout his history, man has built or caused to be built various monuments to perpetuate his and his memory. This desire has also caused man to make his greatest effort to serve his fellow man. In this way, the greatest benefactors of the human race have built their most lasting earthly monuments of immortality. The material monuments which man has built to perpetuate his name and his memory, from the Appian Way, the Towers of Babylon, the Walls of China, the truncated temples that lie beneath the jungles of Mexico, the shrines of Tibet, the Tower of Pisa, or the tombs of the pharaohs of Egypt, to the smallest headstone that identifies the humblest peasant in the country churchyard in Happy Hollow, will crumble into dust and be no more. The longest lasting of the monuments built by man to pass into the history of nothingness will be those monuments built by the benefactors of humanity to bring the chasm that separates all the earthly monuments from eternity. Man knows that he must look to something else. Science has not yet been willing to accept this challenge until it has undertaken to solve and has solved this problem. It must be satisfied to accept second place to the church in the minds and souls of men. What is the best answer so far? My father, who was a farmer and justice of the peace, was also for 67 years a Baptist minister. During his ministerial life, he usually served about four regular churches, and during the summer months, when he was not too busy attending to his farm, he held what they called protracted meetings. Those meetings would sometimes last for two or three weeks. After I had been practicing law for several years, I visited him one summer when he was conducting such a protracted meeting. It was a nice church, and he had a splendid audience of country people to whom to preach. He took for text that day the second and third verses of the fourteenth chapter of St. John. He was a great orator, and he believed that he was inspired to preach to the people. He spoke to his congregation for about 50 minutes on the subject of his text. It was a magnificent presentation of his conception of heaven, of eternity. The reaction of the people to whom he was preaching was classic beyond description. After he had adjourned the service and we started home, he asked me how I liked his sermon, and I told him that it was a masterpiece and that the reaction of the audience was a classic. With a flash in his eyes, he asked, What do you mean by that? I knew that I had come to the test, and that I could not maintain the integrity of my own soul if I flinched, hedged, or pulled my punches, so I resolved to meet the challenge. I said to him, Dad, you know that I have profound love and respect for you, and that within the fields of the sphere of your knowledge... I would not dare question your convictions. But in the field that can only be reached by an interpretation of the Bible, or within the aspirations of the human spirit, I have a right to question. I said to him further, I have paid as much as ten dollars for a ticket to see a number of shows, none of which compared with your sermon and the reaction of your audience. I really enjoyed it. I think you did and I am certain that your audience did. But permit me to make this observation. You failed to grasp the implications of the latter part of the second verse which says, I go to prepare a place for you. For my earnest, sincere, and prayerful study, research and intellectual and spiritual reflections, 
I have come to accept Christ. The evidence to me is too convincing not to accept him. Not only the prophecy of his coming, but his life, teachings, and the results of that life, and of those teachings upon the hearts and the lives of men who come under the influence, remove all doubt in my mind of the divinity of Christ. But as he was leaving his friends and followers, he said to them, In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. He did not undertake to describe the place or the conditions which he was going to prepare. I am most profoundly grateful for this life and all of its relations, and I do not possess the language to express my gratitude and thankfulness to the author for giving me such a marvelous gift. It is an unfolding panorama of glory to me. I am trying to be worthy of such a gift. But if I could live a thousand years, I could not describe even a fraction of this life and its relations. You undertook within about fifty minutes to describe the details of the place Christ has gone to prepare, of heaven, of eternity. This is what I mean by saying that your sermon was a masterpiece and the reaction of your audience was a classic. End quote. I accept as true, until some scientist has disproven it, Christ's promise to prepare a place for me, and I leave the details to him. I believe that the kind of place he will prepare for me will be in keeping with the manner in which I have appreciated and tried to improve this life, and I commensurate with my intellectual and spiritual development. I think that this is the meaning of the Bible when it says that if we are faithful over a few things, we shall be made ruler over many things. Bob Ingersoll, when grief-stricken, standing by the side of his brother's coffin, believed that, quote, in spite of our doubts and fears, love can hear the rustle of a wing. I had the great pleasure of dining with the late Thomas A. Edison several times. Mr. Edison was not much of an orthodox religionist, but he was enabled to turn the light on in this world. Some hours before he died, he dropped into a state of coma, but a few seconds before he stopped breathing, he was distinctly heard to say, quote, It is beautiful over there. Until the scientists and evolutionists can improve upon Edison's vision of over there, I can leave the details to him who has gone to prepare a place for me. Chapter 13 The Giants The fifth chapter of Genesis is given as the book of the generations of Adam. Immediately following, in the fourth verse of the sixth chapter of Genesis, the statement is made that, quote, there were giants in the earth in those days, and that they were mighty men. If we scan the facts relative to this statement, we have absolute and conclusive proof of the authenticity of the Bible story of creation, and the fact that the original Garden of Eden was in the Western Hemisphere and not in Asia, and that Adam and Eve were created in the Apalachicola Valley of West Florida. Now, what is the proof? Let us dig out the landmarks which a wayfarer, though he be a fool, cannot fail to understand. Where were the giants created? Where did they live? What evidence do we have that they lived in the Western Hemisphere? Between Ocala and Gainesville, Florida, there have been uncovered the skeletons of a number of giants. Also at Cedar Keys, Camp Palms, and Sneeds, Florida, and in the Okefenokee Swamp, Georgia, and near Paducah, Kentucky, have been uncovered the skeletons of a number of giants. Near Sneeds, Florida, 
the skeletons of a large giant was found. Let us go deeper into the subject. When the Spaniards conquered Mexico, they found the country occupied by a highly civilized people called the Aztecs. They did not know from whence they came, nor how long they had occupied the country. Exploring the country, the Spaniards found, far back in the tropical jungles, a dead city built of solid stone. The Aztecs knew nothing of this city. The buildings were of one, two, and three stories, with palaces, temples, and pyramids. The stones of these buildings are of such immense size that only giants or supermen could have handled them. How they were hewn and put in place baffles the imagination of modern man. The best authorities say that they are still standing. The following is taken from Life magazine, April 27, 1953. Quote, In the state of Chiapa, Mexico, are the ruins of Palencia. These ruins extend over a large area, covered with a dense tropical forest, and are of a difficult exploration. They consist of many buildings, among which are enormous truncated pyramids of cut stone. The truncated top of the pyramid has an area of one acre. The ground area is much more than an acre. The distance from the truncated top must be hundreds of feet. Built on top of this truncated pyramid is a temple for worship. Its floor area is one acre. Its walls are 25 feet high. The entire structure, pyramid, temple, and all is built of a cut stone so large that human beings of today could not handle them." End quote. This is the work of the giants mentioned in Genesis chapter 6 verse 4. A corridor runs around the building, temple, opening into four interior courts, which open into many smaller rooms. See Chambers Encyclopedia, 2nd edition, 1887, volume 6, page 30. In 1948, Alberto Ruz of Mexico's Institute of Anthropology made an amazing discovery in the temple of the inscription at Palenque. One stone slab in the floor was built to be removed like the lid of a box. Under the slab was an arched stone stairway leading down into the pyramid's interior. The stairway had been filled with rocks and clay, and Ruse could not get where it led, but with helpers he started digging to find out. It took four years to reach the bottom. There, Ruse found another movable stone. Behind it lay a mysterious, cavernous room. Its walls were covered with carvings of priests. From its ceilings dripped snowy stalactites. The room was dominated by a huge stone slab. When he and his men lifted the slab, they found the reason for the pyramid's hidden chamber. There, surrounded by jade ornaments, lie a moldering skeleton. The coffin in which the skeleton lay is one of the finest in the Western Hemisphere. The ornaments inside and out of the coffin were of jade only, which means that they had not yet learned the art of polishing the harder jewels and of metallurgy. In the Egyptian pyramids, built many ages later, were found ornaments made of precious metals and the hardest stone, another proof that the Mexican pyramids and temples are older. In the Mexican sarcophagus are found only skeletons. In the Egyptian, are found embalmed mummies. The science of embalming was learned after the Mexican pyramids and temples were built. The walls of the room above the Berry Chamber in the Mexican pyramid were covered with the carvings of priests and wise men, all in teleosis. The lid between these two rooms weighed 10,000 pounds. It is of dressed limestone, which only giants could have handled. 
Upon the upper surface of this 10,000 pound stone is a human sacrifice victim in bas relief offered up by priests. In the ancient city of Babylon was the temple of Belus, 480 feet high, also designed and built by the order of the wise men of Melchizedek, as a prophecy. On its top was a shrine or place of worship, incomplete pattern of the temple built on top of the truncated pyramids in Mexico. Can there be any doubt as to which is the oldest? Positively not. The Mexican antedates the Babylonian by thousands of years. On the Andean plateau of Peru, two and one half miles above sea level, the source of luxuriant crops and vegetation are other evidences that the original creation was in the Western Hemisphere and not in Asia, and that giants were in the earth in those days, just as Genesis chapter 6 verse 4 tells us. Scattered over this lofty table land are vast quantities of hewn stones, the works of ancient giants. Many of these hewn stones are slabs 38 feet long, 18 feet wide, and 6 feet thick. In 1846, many idols were excavated 30 feet long, 18 feet wide, and 6 feet thick. Ruins of great edifices were found everywhere throughout the country. Those great edifices were designed and planned by the holy wise men of the order of Melchizedek, and the work or labor was done by the giants. Many thousands of those hewn stones used in these great edifices weighed over 700,000 pounds. Many of the idols weighed over 500,000 pounds. On the shore of Lake Titicaca are the ruins of sculptured monolithic doorways, one of which is 10 feet high and 13 feet wide, so made for giants to use. All the above-mentioned giants perished with the flood, as did the giant mastodons. There can be no question but that the ancient ruins of the Western Hemisphere antedate those of anywhere in the world. Chapter 14 River of Eden The tenth verse, second chapter of Genesis says, A river went out of Eden to water the garden. From thence it was parted and became into four heads. In 1912, Rev. L. T. Nichols of Rochester, New York, wrote a book entitled Spiritual Creation and the Decline of Religion. On page 30 of his book, he made this statement, quote, Men have searched in vain for such a river that ran through the Garden of Eden and parted in four heads, and, being unable to find it, most people have given it up as a myth, and it has resulted in many laying aside the Bible as only folklore. End quote. Then Reverend Nichols undertakes to show that the river in question was a spiritual river. My answer is that the men who searched for such a river did not look far enough. A few years ago, the United States engineers undertook to make a detailed survey of the Chattahoochee, Flint, Apalachicola River system from North Georgia to the Gulf of Mexico, looking toward the development of the area traversed by the river for navigation, flood control, hydroelectrical, power, and recreation. The Congress of the United States finally approved the development of said river system, and the engineers have been building large dams at Buford, Georgia, and at Chattahoochee, Florida. Just north of Chattahoochee is the exact location where the river went out of Eden to water the garden. For over 100 years, the United States engineers have been noted for accuracy. They erected a large signboard and painted on that board the river system. It will be seen that the river does have four heads, right at the point where the river Pison went out of Eden to water the garden. It is the only river in the world with four heads. 
This is a complete answer to Dr. Nichols and to all other critics who claim man has searched in vain for such a river. The river that went out of Eden to water the garden was the river Pison mentioned in the 11th verse of the second chapter of Genesis. The Indians later named it Chattahoochee Appalachicola. This alone proves beyond all doubt that the biblical account is true and that the garden was in the Appalachicola Valley of West Florida. Here is another absolute proof that this was the river that went out of Eden at a point just north of what is now Chattahoochee, Florida, to water the garden from there south to Bristol, Florida. The 11th verse of the second chapter of Genesis tells us that the first of said riverheads, quote, is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. Havilah was North Georgia, and every Georgia cracker knows that from where the Chattahoochee River rises in North Georgia, down to the fall line at Columbus, Georgia, it flows through a great gold belt. The United States government maintained a gold mint at Dahlonega, Georgia, for many years, and prior to 1849, when gold was discovered in California. Three-fourths of the gold mined in this country was mined in North Georgia. Out of Duke's Creek at Helen, Georgia, vast quantities of gold have been taken. On June 3, 1830, Governor Gilmer of Georgia issued a proclamation warning, quote, All persons, whether the citizens of this or other states, or Indians, to cease all further trespass upon the property of the state, and especially from taking any gold or silver from the lands included within the territory occupied by the Cherokee Indians." End quote. This proclamation may be seen in the Senate Documents 512 of the United States Senate of the 23rd Congress, First Session, Volume 8, page 231. In October 1830, the governor of Georgia called the General Assembly of Georgia into special session with recommendation to pass a law, quote, with teeth in it, which the legislature did in the Act of Georgia Laws, 1830, page 114, giving the state of Georgia criminal jurisdiction and power to prevent white persons from residing in the disputed area and providing a guard for the protection of the gold mines. Many people think of gold as being gold in them that are hills, or wherever you find it. But this is true only from the layman's viewpoint. Those who have dug deeper into the components of gold know that there is a vast difference in the color, the purity, and the quality of gold. God inspired the author of the second chapter of Genesis to identify specifically the gold of Havilah, North Georgia, by describing it as good. That was done to further tie down the birthplace of man and the Garden of Eden. In the twelfth verse of said second chapter, it is written, quote, And the gold of that land is good. In that the way the gold of North Georgia was identified, as being separate and apart from all other gold, and those who have studied the different colors, purity, and quality of the gold taken from the various parts of the earth know that this is true. It serves also to describe a natural monument by which the Garden of Eden can be definitely located. The descendants of Noah, after landing in Asia, never ceased to talk about good gold in the land of Havilah, they described it to their children and to those who came after them. And that gold became a part of the psychological thinking of all peoples of this earth, and has remained so until this day. It was the desire of the descendants of Noah to return to the Western Hemisphere and to acquire again that good gold. And that desire caused them to travel up the coasts of Asia, to cross over what is now the Bering Strait and to bring about the resettlement of the Western Hemisphere.
It is rather strange that throughout human history, those peoples who control the largest amount of gold directed the course of human events. And it is also strange that only those nations who based their currency on gold had any permanent economy founded in a civilized society. Great scholars, including the greatest politicians and economists, have never been able to explain why this is true. The psychological value of gold seems to have been planted in the souls of all people. You may take a child or any race of status of social and economic development and offer him a $100 bill in any system of currency and at the same time offer him a $20 gold piece and he will take the $20 gold piece in preference to the $100 bill. Just as God has planted in the soul of every human being on this earth the psychological desire to own and possess something which is peculiarly his, which fact makes the ultimate domination of communism an impossibility, so the psychological value of gold to all the people of this earth will forever make gold the only permanent basis of the economy of any nation that desires security and progress. From the time Noah and his family landed in Asia until the present day, the peoples of all the rest of the earth have desired and will continue to desire the good gold mentioned in Genesis chapter 2 verse 12. I spent several years in North Georgia studying the great gold deposits of that area, and while most of those deposits are embedded in clays and cannot be sluiced or in crystals deeply embedded in the earth, North Georgia is one of the great gold belts of the world. As an illustration, one may dig from the banks of any street in the little city of Canton, Georgia, a gold pan full of placer clay. There are 28 of such pans in a yard, and then taking the time to separate the gold from the clay, it will be found that it is richer in gold than 90% of the placers which have been and are being worked in California or Alaska. Millions upon millions of dollars have been expended to try to find out how to separate economically the gold from the clays of North Georgia, but so far vainly. When and if that problem is ever solved, it will result in stabilizing the economy of this earth. If only a fraction of the money that is now being expended for military purposes, were expended in that effort, the results would be much greater. In keeping with the conspiracy to control the United States and its economy, Europeans began large withdrawals of gold which they had on deposit in this country. The continuance of those withdrawals resulted in the serious depression under President Hoover's administration with this constant threat hanging over our economy, we were unable to meet the payments in gold provided for in most of our private and governmental obligations, and at the same time to increase production fast enough to provide employment for our expanding population. To meet this challenge, President Roosevelt urged the Congress to enact legislation abrogating the gold clause in our public and private obligations, and to provide in the place thereof a form of currency as a legal tender for all public and private debts. I have now before me a piece of paper called a $20 bill, or Federal Reserve Note. On the face of it, the following appears, quote, The United States of America will pay to the bearer on demand $20. In very small print is the following. This note is legal tender for all debts, public and private, and is redeemable in lawful money at the United States Treasury or at any Federal Reserve Bank. End quote. It is stated that this note is redeemable in lawful money, but I cannot send or take it to the United States Treasury and receive gold for it. Any foreigner who might own it can demand and receive gold for it. 
American citizens cannot demand gold for this paper called legal tender, but foreigners who happen to own some of this can and do receive gold from our treasury, therefore. In adopting this monetary system, we assumed that we could do something in complete violation of God's law, something which no other people in all human history had been able to do. This, quote, controlled monetary system worked well from the start because it was backed by an economy and a credit structure handed down to us by our forebears. This controlled monetary system worked well from the start because it was backed by an economy and a credit structure handed down to us by our forebears whose philosophy of life and of government was entirely different from ours today. This monetary system, tied in with our income tax law, has licensed extravagance while it has developed in the minds of millions of people in this country and abroad the idea that it is not wrong and in violation of God's law to try to get something for nothing. Because of this monetary system, ambitious politicians are unwilling to resist the demands of pressure groups and nations all over the world. Because of this system, we are unable to enact those measures and to inaugurate those programs to which the party in power committed itself for fear of further heavy withdrawals of gold from deposit in this country. Because we resorted to expediency in the early days of Franklin Roosevelt's administration, our economy and our American way of life are now at the mercy of the machinations of Europe and pressure groups at home. When the rules of any game, whether it be sports, finances, or government, must be changed at every play, confusion will inevitably result. The pirates and gangsters have plundered the Western Hemisphere for that good gold, and will continue to do so. As stated by Dr. Nichols, in his above referred to book, men have searched in vain for such a river, and being unable to find it, have caused many people to lay aside their Bible as being fiction. But that was before the United States engineers definitively proved that there is a river of four heads, and that those four river heads junction at what is now Chattahoochee, Florida. The climate topography, soils, and tree life, including the gopher wood tree, make the area below the junction of the rivers a veritable garden. Throughout the history of civilized man, he has wherever possible identified and tied down the boundaries, the location of the most important things, by natural monuments, particularly bodies of water lakes, rivers, and mountains. Under God's direction, the author of the book of Genesis definitely fixed and tied down forever the location of the original Garden of Eden by the river of four heads, the good gold of North Georgia, and Bedellium, and the onyx stone. There has never been, and is not now, any other place on this entire earth that has the river of four heads with the good gold that North Georgia has. Therefore, the strongest proof that man can find of the location of the original Garden of Eden are the river of four heads, which junctions at Chattahoochee, Florida, good gold of North Georgia, etc., and the water, climate, tree life, and the gopher wood tree below Chattahoochee. There is not any other proof on earth equal to this. The four river heads are numbered and named according to length, size, and importance. This natural monument of the river of four heads is conclusive proof as to the location of the original Garden of Eden. A study of the texts of all major encyclopedias 
conclusively shows that man had never been able to locate a river of four heads until the United States engineers definitively established that fact in the survey above related. There is further corroborating proof in the fact that the first of said four river heads, the one which the Indians named Chattahoochee, rises in one of the great gold belts of the world and flows through a great gold belt to the fall line at Columbus and the existence of Bedellium and Onyx Stone of North Georgia. The twelfth verse of the second chapter of Genesis tells us that the river Pison, or Chattahoochee, compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is, quote, Bedellium and the Onyx Stone. Bedellium is gum resin. Georgia has long been noted for its gum resin. God told Noah to pitch the ark inside and out with it. Onyx stone is nothing but white marble with layers or bands of black or different colors through it. Every school child in Georgia knows that vast quantities of such onyx stone exist in North Georgia the mining of which constitutes one of the major industries of the state. The name of the river was changed by the Indians to Chattahoochee, Apalachicola, long, long after the flood, and after Noah had left this country. In the thirteenth verse of the second chapter of Genesis, it is stated, quote, And the name of the second river is Gihon, the same is that it compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. Ethiopia is in East Central Africa, and there is no river that flows out of West Asia into Ethiopia of Africa. It would have to flow across a great desert, then across the Red Sea, then uphill paralleling the Nile, which flows downhill and north. No wonder the author of Britannica did not mention the river Gihon when discussing the subject, neither did it mention Pison. The writer of the article was in deep water. He did not have the teleosis key. The thing that has confused Bible students in their efforts to locate the original Garden of Eden has been the account of the rivers mentioned in the 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, and fourteenth verses of the second chapter of Genesis. When they read the names of the rivers and the names of the places mentioned in the verses, they think of the names of such rivers and such places as being in Western Asia or Africa. Those names were given to those rivers and to those places long after the flood. There was a small community in southwest Georgia known as Assyria. It was located within what is now Seminole County, Georgia, and it too was a community within Eden. The river called Heidekel was one of the four head rivers shown in the United States Engineers Survey, and it flowed along the east boundary of the community, Assyria. The other river, Euphrates, was the smallest of the four head rivers shown on the survey. The rivers and places in Western Asia and Africa by the same names were so named long after the flood. Those names were transplanted from here over there, just as many European names have been transplanted into this country from Europe since Columbus discovered America. Names of people things and places are continued down through the files of time. Noah and his family were thoroughly familiar with said rivers and places, and when the ark landed in Western Asia, they and their progeny perpetuated those names. Those names have had more to do with this assumption that the Garden of Eden was in Western Asia than everything else. Pison, Gihon, Heidekel, Assyria, Ethiopia and Euphrates are all teleosis names and convey a special meaning. Chapter 15 Intellectual Responsibility 
Christ recognized individual liberty as the keystone of intellectual responsibility when he said, quote, Let whosoever will come and partake of the water of life freely. It is one of the few things that was not born to die. Nations rise and fall. Religions and philosophies are born and die. The Tower of Babel lifted its spiral curves in misunderstanding to kiss the clouds and then tumbled into dust. Cults and creeds, denominations and philosophies have swayed the minds of untold millions and have enforced themselves both with sword and with faggot, only to be swept by the broom of time into the world's great rubbish heap as intellectual trash. These things have become signboards on the highway of history, but man's God-given gift of the power of choice, liberty, continues to shine with the unchanging brightness of the morning star as it gleams and glitters amidst the intense darkness that precedes the dawn. Tyrants have tried to destroy liberty. Despots have trampled it underfoot. Madmen have proclaimed that it is an opiate with which to deceive the sons of toil. But irrespective of their ravings, it still stands out as the most precious endowment of the human attribute and rises above all other values as the mountain peak rises above the surrounding foothills. Any system of economics or of government, whether centered in Russia, China, the United States, or any other lands, which seeks to deny or abridge it, will also become as but debris on the highways of history. Chapter 16 Why I Have Written This Book Before the late Dr. Brown Landone departed this life at his home in Winter Park, Florida, on October 10th, 1945, he invited to me his home for a conference. He said to me, quote, You have been nominated and initiated to write an interpretation of one of the most important facts and one of the greatest events in human history. It will mean that you will have to close your law office and your home in Lakeland and move to an entirely different location in Florida. I am unable to tell you where you are going, but after you get there, you will be given the teleosis key of interpretation that will enable you to interpret accurately the great fact and the great event which you have been chosen by the holy men of Melchizedek to interpret. End quote. He did not elaborate. I did not have the slightest idea then that I would move from Lakeland or what he had in mind, but within less than two weeks, my brother and I made a trip into the Apalachicola Valley of West Florida for the purpose of looking over some farmland. On that trip, we bought two farms in Liberty County, and I began to visit Liberty County every three weeks. On the 14th of March, 1946, I closed my law offices and home in Lakeland and moved to Blountston, Florida. I had no thought of the subject I am discussing, or any idea that I would ever undertake to write such an interpretation. After my arrival, the facts which I am recording began to unfold, and it appeared that there was nothing for me to do but to give them to humanity. Dr. Brown Landone was without a doubt an initiate into the order of the wise men of Melchizedek. I am often asked, what is the order of the wise men of Melchizedek, of which Christ was a high priest? It is not a religion. It is not a material thing. It is an order created by the unlimited intelligence and wisdom of God. It is the stewardship in which God lodged the science of interpretation of the spirit of man to be used and unfolded at the divine will. Its pillars uphold the arch of universal education in both material and spiritual things. The priests of the order of Melchizedek are not appointed or elected, but are ordained of God, 
and of great purpose, and for a great purpose. Quote, Many are called, but few are chosen. To the few who are ordained, God, and that which God wishes revealed to man, is revealed. The priests know that science and theology are but two ends of a single truth, and that man will never attain the highest manifestation of his divine creation until science and religion can work together for the liberation of man from ignorance, superstition, and fear. The priest also knows that the only sin into which man is born is the sin of ignorance, but he is happy because he also knows that when Mother Eve made the choice to eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge in the Garden of Eden, man was endowed with the capacity to know good from evil, and when he ate the fruit of the tree of life, he became capable of using his liberty when God had given him in helping to produce something better. The high priest of the order of Melchizedek seeks no greater reward than liberty plus opportunity to help produce something better. His happiness is an unfolding happiness as he labors to liberate man from the state of ignorance. He knows that for each individual this life is the time allotted to him for accomplishment and that the failure to use every moment to help produce something better is the only unpardonable sin. He knows that the arts, sciences, and religions are monuments to what man has already accomplished. He, therefore, bows to truth, regardless of the bearer, and does not wrangle over the one who brings it. He climbs the stairs of spiritual enfoldment, his symbol is that of an old man, leaning upon a staff, with his eyes sheltered by the brows of a philosopher. He is old in understanding and wisdom, the true measurements of age. He is only concerned with time as we measure time, for after all, he knows that time is only man-made division of eternity to measure the passage of human events. He kneels but only to the triple energies of reason, desire, and action, which are united in blending of his expressions, for he has been ordained by the living God of energy, life, intelligence, and love, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Prophecies, but you may say, I do not believe in prophecies. I assume that you are honest and sincere. If you would like to have all doubt removed as to the truthfulness of the prophecies of the wise men of Melchizedek, read and study the prophecies of the Bible concerning the cities of Babylon, Nineveh, and Jerusalem, and of Egypt, and of the coming birth of Christ. You will know that the Bible is true, and you should especially study the date when these prophecies are made. Noah's Ark in the sixth chapter of Genesis, verse 14, quote, God said unto Noah, Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. God instructed Noah to build the ark three hundred cubits long, fifty cubits wide, and thirty cubits high. A cubit is twenty-one inches. So the ark was about the size of a modern ocean freight steamer. It was built out of gopher wood, which grew just north of Bristol in Liberty County, Florida. We know this because, as Dr. Nyland stated, gopher wood grows only there. It was then pitched with material taken from the pine forests of the area. An abundance of pitch was nearby. The ninth verse of the sixth chapter of Genesis says, quote, Two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark, to keep them alive. They shall be male and female. And in the twentieth verse of the sixth chapter of Genesis, God said to Noah, Two of every sort shall come unto thee, to keep them alive. One of my good friends said to me some time ago, 
I do not believe all the bunk about Noah and his ark, because all the animals could not be found in one place, so a male and a female of each breed could come into the ark. I asked him if he knew that out of the Ashley lime beds of South Carolina had been taken either the whole or fossilized parts of the bones of every animal that had ever been known to have existed on this earth, and that over 250 of them were on display at the World's Fair held in New Orleans a few years ago. He replied that he did not know that, but it is a fact. There is a subsurface limestone deposit of vast proportions which extends northwest-southeast through Jackson, Calhoun, Liberty, and Leon counties, Florida, which has been very limitedly explored, and yet from it, bones or fossilized bones of every animal that ever lived on this earth have been taken. Both University of Tallahassee and the Fuller's Earth Plant, just north of Quincy, have large collections of such specimens. After Noah had built the Ark of Gopherwood, just north of Bristol, Florida, the Lord said unto him in the first verse, seventh chapter of Genesis, quote, Come thou and all thy house into the Ark, for thee I have seen righteousness before me in this generation. Noah's entire family was saved because he had found, quote, grace in the eyes of the Lord. Sometimes one righteous member of a family may save the whole family. Sometimes one good life may save a city. Because Noah had found grace in the eyes of the Lord, he saved man from complete annihilation. God told Noah in the fourth verse of Genesis that after seven days, I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights. So it rained forty days and forty nights. The Lord kept mixing H2O until he had covered the earth with water, fifteen cubits deep, on the highest mountain. The ark was lifted up above the earth, and the high hills that were under the whole earth were covered. A press release from London recently carried the following announcement. Wood found on Ararat, believed part of Ark. London, a team of American archaeologists looking for the remains of Noah's Ark, reported Friday several pieces of wood, apparently part of a huge boat, have been found 14,000 feet up the slopes of Mount Ararat in eastern Turkey. George Vandeman, chairman of the American-based Archaeological Research Foundation, told a news conference here he hoped to know for certain within three years whether or not the Ark is on the mountain. Vandeman said the pieces of wood fitted in with the research through the years. The evidence suggested that they came from a boat about two-thirds the size of the British Cunard liner Queen Mary. The Queen Mary is 1,019 feet long, 118 feet wide. In 1955, said Vandeman, another piece of wood, 7 feet long, was found in an ice pack in the same area. It was estimated to date from around 2,500 BC. Ark floated from Bristol, Florida to Mount Ararat in Armenia. Quote, the waters prevailed upon the earth 150 days. The ark did not have any propelling power. It just floated or drifted with the wind of atmosphere for 150 days and nights. Quote, God made a wind to pass over the earth. We know from a teleosis scientific standpoint that cannot be refuted that there is an eastward drift of the wind or atmosphere from Bristol, Liberty County, Florida, to Mount Ararat in Armenia. We know from a teleosis certainty that this drift of the atmosphere is what causes the changes in our seasons. We know from a teleosis certainty 
the normal rate of travel or speed of the drift of that wind or atmosphere. We know the distance from Bristol, Florida, to Mount Ararat. We know the exact size of the arc in length, breadth, and height. We know from a teleosis mathematical certainty just how fast an arc of that size would have drifted or traveled within the atmosphere within 150 days and nights. We know from a teleosis mathematical certainty that it would have traveled, in fact did travel, from Bristol, Florida to Mount Ararat in Armenia during the 150 days and nights that it was afloat. Did not know they had landed on Mount Ararat. Noah and his family did not know that they had landed on Mount Ararat, so far from their original home in Liberty County, Florida. They thought they had been drifting around over the mountains of the southern Appalachians, and that was why they called some of the rivers near where they landed by the names of the rivers they had known in this country as Gihon, Heidekel, and Euphrates. That was why they called some of the areas near where they landed by the names of the areas they had known in this country. That was why they called some of the areas near where they landed by the names of the areas they had known in this country, such as Assyria, Ethiopia, etc. That is what has confused so many Bible students who did not have the teleosis key in interpreting it. That is why they assumed that it had happened over there. If the ark had been built anywhere in or near the area in Western Asia, as had been falsely assumed or supposed for such a long time, it would have been an utter impossibility for the ark to have landed on Mount Ararat. It would have drifted with the wind or atmosphere during the 150 days and nights that it was afloat thousands of miles east, and could not have landed on Mount Ararat. Many people have asked, well, if the ark really landed on Mount Ararat, why hasn't someone found it, or parts of it? They never stop to realize that the ark was built of wood, and that Noah and his sons needed wood to build new homes, and other buildings after they had landed and that the most natural thing for them to have done would have been to dismantle the ark and use the lumber for other purposes. I have laughed at the expeditions headed by so-called intelligent men going to try to find the ark. Many ships built out of wood thousands of years since the ark was built have been dismantled, and the wood used for other purposes so that no trace can be found of them. But as heretofore stated, it appears that the ark has been found on Mount Ararat. Why gopher wood? Why did the Lord select gopher wood for the building of the ark? They grow nearby, every tree that was pleasant to the sight. Why then only gopher wood? I think that gopher wood was selected because when it is dry, it is almost as light as cork and yet it is one of the strongest and most durable wood that can be found. That is why the native people of Liberty County cut the largest gopher trees and split them into fence posts. They last beyond the memory of men. A fine Presbyterian minister, who has devoted over sixty years to the service of his Lord, recently said, quote, Noah and his family built the ark out of a wood that grows in the Bristol area, a wood that to this very day has not been found anywhere else in the whole world. It has been given the name gopher wood. It must undoubtedly be the gopher wood mentioned in the Bible as being the stuff out of which Noah's ark was built. And since gopher wood mentioned in the Bible is found nowhere else in the world, it is here that Noah built his ark. Gopher wood is mentioned in the Hebrew text of the Old Bible. The word as it is used in our English versions of the Bible is a transliteration, not a translation, 
of the Hebrew word gopher. Scholars have borrowed the Hebrew word gopher itself because they have never been sure just what kind of tree it was that the Hebrews called the gopher trees. Some texts translate the word into English texts as cypress. Nobody knows just what the Jews meant when they said gopher trees. They are so named because they are supposed to be unique in this world. No one has been able to find them growing anywhere in the world. My mission is to let the world know of the real truth of the matter. No other tree in all the world has the same designed leaf or straw. The tree never normally grows a single leaf. It always grows two leaves forming a perfect cross. The shape of the straws of the leaves and their general design is a perfect teleosis and conveys a great meaning and truth to one who has been provided the teleosis key. The teleosis key written in stone into the design and construction of every great holy temple by the wise men of Melchizedek definitely points out and names this tree and its symbolisms just as the supreme intelligence in designing every snowflake planted purpose there which man has at last discovered and is beginning to profit by. The same intelligence designed the leaves and the structure of the gopher trees for a specific purpose, and they carry a message to mankind that no other tree on earth conveys, that of the value of a good life. That is why Florida enacted a law to protect them. John V. Fasson, W. D. McDaniel, Tom Reddick, and I found and dug out of the ground in Garden of Eden, north of Bristol, Florida, parts of three gopher wood logs. They are sawn chunks or parts of said logs and are from four to eight feet long. They are hard as many flint rock on earth. They were parts of the logs used to build the ark. After they were sawn, they lay in the water for at least seven months, and during that time, such chemical reactions set that they did not rot or decay, but petrified. Doubting Thomases On the 19th day of March, 1952, Florida State Geologist Herman Gunter entertained as his guests a number of out-of-state geologists and their wives, together with a number of college professors. Knowing that the Garden of Eden, north of Bristol, around the Alum Bluff section, is a place of great interest and beauty, he invited them to accompany him there. After reaching the Alum Bluff section, a number of the younger geologists and professors slid down the steep cliffs in search of rare geological specimens, while some of the older of Mr. Gunter's guests, including several ladies, remained on the heights overlooking the great river valley. I said to one of them, you are now within less than one quarter mile of a number of beautiful gopher trees. You might like to see them while you are here, for this is the only place on earth where they grow. A tall, handsome, scholarly appearing professor from one of the noted colleges in the east, a religious college, asked, What are gopher trees? When I replied, I understand you to say, that you were a professor at Yale. He answered, I am, but what has that to do with gopher trees? Several of the ladies spoke up and said, that is the wood from which the ark was built. And then he said, I don't believe that story. The ladies almost unanimously said, we do. And if there are gopher trees here, we want to see them. I took several of them including the college professor, to see the gopher trees. After he saw and felt them, his facial expression reminded me of that reputed pilot on another occasion. 
of all the calamities and disasters that have befallen man, none equaled in its catastrophic disaster the flood of Noah's day, mentioned in Genesis. All people who have lived on this earth since the days of the flood, regardless of race, color, creed, location, or age in which they lived, have in their histories and their legends the story of such a great flood, a thing of such universal belief and acceptation had to have had its origin in fact. There stands an unimpeachable evidence of the flood, the fact that the face of the whole earth carries pronounced and unimpeachable marks and scars of the destruction of the universal flood that thousands of years of time have not been able to obliterate. The more the scientists, explorers, excavators, and construction crews dig into the bowels of the earth, the more evidence they unfold of the authenticity of the Great Flood. It is a fact that in many regions remote from the rivers and the seashores, even in the higher elevations of Europe, Asia, Africa, and America, whole trees were sunk into the ground as were the teeth and bones of animals, entire fish, seashells, and other things which became petrified. These are uncovered by the best naturalists, who agree that they could have never been there except for some great deluge. The First Honeybees The beekeepers tell us that there were no honeybees in the Western world before Columbus discovered America. During the search for rare geological specimens by Mr. Herman Gunter's geological guests on March 18th of 1952, one geologist found buried in the steep cliffs at Alum Bluff in the Garden of Eden a large specimen of bee honeycomb, petrified of course, in the cells of which were perfect honeybees. The young geologist who found it announced to his fellow scientists as he climbed back to the top of the cliff, I found a specimen of cliff-dwelling bees. Since then, other specimens of bee honeycombs have been found there, which conclusively show that honeybees lived in the Garden of Eden thousands of years before Columbus courted Queen Isabella. Oldest Geology the oldest geology on this earth is the Appalachian Mountain area of eastern United States. It was three billion years old when the Rocky Mountain area was born. This is admitted by the best informed geologists. It is so old that in many places the subsurface granite has rotted. Some years ago I accompanied three of the nation's greatest geologists in surveying that area, from Lock 12 on the Coosa River to Lynchburg, Virginia. We drilled hundreds of holes with the best machinery that Bucerus and Keystone make. At many places, when the drill bit drilled through the upper placers, it dropped into a stiff, putty-like, decayed granite. These geologists admitted that that area is the oldest part on this earth. They agreed that it was three billion years old when the Rocky Mountains were pushed up. During the Great Flood, some of the mountains in that area were from 15 to 20,000 feet in elevation. It was upon one of those mountains that Noah and his family believed they had landed when the Ark rested on Mount Ararat in Armenia. First Dry Land in the first chapter of Genesis, it is related that, quote, God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the water, and let it divide the waters from the waters. So, God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the water which were above the firmament. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And God called the dry land earth, 
and the gathering of waters he called seas. The area which we know as the Appalachian country of eastern United States, being the oldest geology on earth, was the first dry land to appear on this earth, and it divided the waters from the waters, and still does. The waters flowing eastward into what is now the Atlantic, and westward into what is now the Gulf, but formerly into the waters we know as the Pacific. The Rocky Mountain area was formed later, as I will explain. But before the Rocky Mountains, the waters flowing westward from Appalachians flowed into the Pacific instead of the Gulf. Place of the Two Creations As I have stated, there were two definite creations of people, and that fact is as certain as anything can be. The people of the first period of creation, male and female, spoken of in the first chapter of Genesis, were created in the high Appalachian area, but they did not have a soul, the power of choice, and all perished with the flood. Through the vicissitudes of time, the high mountains of the Appalachians area began to erode and to wash away, and the streams carried the refuse away, east, west, and south, to form the valleys and plains, west, south, and east. The whole of Eden was thus made or formed. Ages and ages later, God, quote, formed man out of the dust of the ground, about one mile east of the present town of Bristol, Florida, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul, soul being the power of choice. That man was Adam, created at the second creation. Adam was formed and given life, and a soul about one mile east of Bristol, in Liberty County, Florida. He was created out of the Garden of Eden. Then, God planted a garden, north of Bristol, eastward of Eden, and there he put Adam, to tend the garden. Though Adam was in the choicest place on earth, the Lord saw that he was not happy, and God put him to sleep in the garden, and took from his side a rib, and made Mother Eve. Land of Nod The land of Nod was originally that part of Florida, lying east of the Ochlockney River, and south of the Okefenokee Swamp and St. Mary's River. Quote, Cain dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden, Genesis chapter 4, verse 16. And Cain knew his wife, whom he found in the land of Nod. She was a descendant of the male and female, created during the first period of creation, mentioned in the first chapter of Genesis. Quote, she conceived and bore Enoch, and he buildeth a city after the name of his son, Enoch. Genesis chapter 4, verse 17. This city of Enoch, which Cain built in honor of his son, was built on the exact spot where Tallahassee, Florida, is now located and situated. The descendants of Cain were hybrid people, descendants of both Adam and of the first creation, and they began to build and dwell in tents. They followed the cattle industry. They made musical instruments, harps, and organs. They were also manufacturers and taught manufacturing of brass and iron products. Races of people The different racial people who now inhabit the earth are all descendants of Noah, who came of the seed of Seth. Then why the difference in the races? This is a fine question, and, rightly understood, will do away with all racial prejudices. 
The things which made the difference between the races are climate, food, environment, the pigmentation of his skin, the thickness of the top of his skull, the hair plaited on top of the head, was nature's way of protecting the inner man from the heat to which he was exposed. He lived in a hot, humid climate, and his nostrils were made wide, with very little cartilage in his nose, so he could get enough oxygen into his lungs. His glands gave off a peculiar odor, so as to protect him from the insects of the tropics. Had he not had that odor, the insects would have exterminated him. The life, intelligence, energy, and love, which are manifested in the black man, are exactly the same as manifested through the white man, or any other race, that is, God. Then how can the God that is manifested through the white man say to the God that is manifested through the black man, or the yellow man, or the red man, I am superior to you. God may be manifested through the different individuals in different degrees, but how can a sack full of salt say to a teaspoon of salt, I am saltier than you? Climate, food, and environment can change all men, including the color of their skins, shape of their nostrils, height, habits, character, etc. But basically, all the descendants of Noah were designed by the teleosis principles, and all have a soul, the power of choice, and are held responsible for its abuse. Teleology Many people have asked me, what is teleology? The basic teleosis proportionals are 1, 4, and 7. The primary Teleosis proportionals are 13, 19, 25, and 31. The secondary teleosis proportionals are 10, 16, 22, and 28. By the use of these teleosis proportionals, the holy wise men of the order of Melchizedek have recorded uncommon knowledge and wisdom of the past and true dependable prophecies of the future. These are evident and in the design and construction of all the holy temples of prophecy throughout the ages. With it, they have been able to discover the greatest scientific principles of all time. With its use, they were able to determine definitely the distances to planets and asteroids from the sun and from each other. With it, they were able to determine that there are four determining tones in our musical scales, seven intervals in the major scale, thirteen intervals in the minor scale, and nineteen predominating musical overtones of each note of the finer musical instruments. With it, they were able to determine the size and form that corresponds to all the other parts of the body. This has been proven, beyond question, by measurements exact to a millimeter of the standard human skeletons at Harvard, Cambridge, and Oxford. Every beautiful object of Greek art was made possible through the use of the teleosis proportion. All geometric designs which have been judged sufficiently beautiful to be used in the great artistic and architectural masterpieces are according to teleosis proportions and spaces. The microphotographs of many snowflakes reveal the teleosis proportionals in the forming of the snowflakes. These facts prove that there is a law of divine intelligence which impregnates not only all things of nature but the mind of man as well. An examination of all tree life and all weeds and flowers show that they were designed and built according to the teleosis proportions. A man must absolutely shut his eyes to the truth in order to deny that throughout history there have been a few wise men to whom God conveyed through the order of Melchizedek 
facts and prophecies. Possibly, this has been true because those few men came to feel completely that human wisdom was not sufficient, and they were willing to look for higher guidance. We know that human wisdom has brought us to confusion, economically and internationally. World leaders today are doubters. There is no inspiration in them. Their guidance leads to mutual destruction. The predictions of our world leaders have been mistaken. We drenched the earth with human blood to make the world safe for a democracy, but it was not made safe. We again drenched it with human blood to bring peace, but there is no peace. Our world leaders have brought us to the shadow of Armageddon, and they now seek to look through the shadow in fear and trembling. Leagues of nations and united nations but intensify human fear. All this is the result of man shutting or closing his eyes and refusing to tune in with God. Billions upon billions of stars whirl through limitless miles of space, proving that there is intelligence guiding them in their journey. The designs inside of all snowflakes, the design in all floating clouds, of the colors of the rainbow, and of the morning dawn and the evening sunset, conclusively prove that they were formed by infinite intelligence. Great designs inspired into the minds of some men and urged to strive for something better. They have been provided with the teleosis key for use in unfolding the facts that the truths of the past and the accurate prophecy of the course of the future. This should cause one to know that there is an ever-present central broadcasting station of intelligence. That divine intelligence lodged the key of interpretation of the past and the future in the stewardship of the holy wise men of Melchizedek, of which, according to the twentieth verse of the sixth chapter of Hebrews, Christ himself was a priest. When one has been furnished the information of just how to use the teleosis proportions of 1, 4, and 7, and of 13, 19, 25, and 31, and of 10, 16, 22, and 28, he is then able to unravel and to substantiate facts of outstanding interest. Many men are called scientists. Some are worthy of the title. Others are not. Those who have gone the furthest in discovering and interpreting the laws of nature have been able to do so because they used the principles of teleology, whether they were conscious of it or not. You may ask, why have you been provided with this teleosis key for use in interpreting the Bible. Personally, I do not know why it was communicated to me. I certainly did not seek it. But with it, I have been able to prove conclusively that the original Garden of Eden was in the Apalachicola Valley, and that Adam and Eve were created here, and that Noah built the ark here. These facts are as certain as the principles by which the wise men of Melchizedek discovered the value of pi, 3.14159, and so on. And it is as certain as the principles by which the same wise men learned to determine accurately the area of a circle. Those facts are as true and definite as are the principles developed by the same wise men in arriving at units of measurement. Men have been so confused in developing units of measurement that we have two kinds of tons, three kinds of miles, nine kinds of bushels by federal law, and twenty-six kinds of bushels by state law. The mystic wise men developed a system of measure by using the sides of the square based on the circle built into their great holy temples. 
The circle was based on the Earth's movement around the Sun, and the unit of measurement developed by them are as accurate as the Sun in its journey and shall endure throughout eternity. The thinking of the world as to the exact location of the Garden of Eden and the place where Adam and Eve were created and where Noah built the ark has been in great confusion as has been the thinking of those who developed our jamboreed units of measurement. However, by the use of the teleosis key, furnished me by the order of the wise men of Melchizedek, I have established by absolutely conclusive evidence that the biblical account of the Garden of Eden and of the creation of our first parents and the building of the ark is definitely true. In its efforts to discredit the Bible, and by discrediting it, discredit human liberty and Christian hope itself, the agnostic world has made its greatest attack upon the biblical account of the Garden of Eden and of purposeful creation, including the Great Flood. I was chosen to answer that attack and was provided the teleosis key for use in answering it. I have answered it, and I now challenge the agnostic world to disprove it. I stated, and I emphasized by repeating, that I was chosen by divine intelligence to survey and stake out the bounds of the original Garden of Eden, and to search out and present the evidence in absolute proof of the biblical account of creation and of the location of the original Garden of Eden. I stated that I was provided the scientific principles of teleology for use in making this survey. And in doing this work, in response to this statement, many sincere inquirers have asked me, what is teleology? This inquiry is certainly legitimate. In the first verse of the first chapter of Genesis, says that, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The Bible teaches that God is a harmonious working of the four great unlimited laws of power, energy, life, love, and intelligence. So, unlimited power, unlimited life, unlimited love, and unlimited intelligence, functioning harmoniously together, created heaven and earth. And they declareth and showeth, how readeth thou? Quote, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Declare and showeth are words of manifestation, action, verbs. Teleology is a code of exact scientific principles declared and shown by the relationship of the heaven and the earth and their orderly, harmonious movement. The heaven and the earth were created by intelligence, and they manifest intelligence. The principles they proclaim, the message they convey, the facts they disclose, constitute an exact science. The astronomists learned this long ago. So did the astrologers. Newton discovered its existence. Franklin grasped that its meaning. Einstein looked deeper into its secrets and was then able to persuade President Roosevelt to undertake to spend $2 billion using it to develop atomic power. Without this code of exact scientific principles declared by the heaven and the earth, the atomic submarine could not have been built. The wild ducks the wild goose, and the homing pigeon understands this. So do the beasts of the field and of the forest. We call it instinct. The seminal reads the blooming grass and understands it and carries his loved ones to higher ground for safety from the tropical storm. The man with the hoe upon whose back rests the responsibility to feed the world, 
understands it when he plants his corn, operates upon his livestock, or butchers his meat. Export fishermen do not ignore these facts. The procreative forces of all vegetable and animal life conclusively prove it. The design of the snowflakes and the colors of the rainbow confirm it. Every boy who hunts in the forests during the night reads the stars to find his way home. If the stars are hidden by the clouds, he reads the moss growing on the rocks and the trees, and instantly knows his direction. The influence of the sun upon the moss conveys to him a definite message. The last edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica admits that teleology was the oldest mode of arriving at the truth of many great problems. Then it says that man swung to mechanical conceptions in his efforts to find the truth, but being unable to do so by mechanical conceptions only, the scientific world is swinging back to teleology in one form or another. The Bureau of Ships Journal for April 1955 on page 24 makes this statement, quote, Bureau releases 15 new training films. They have been completed and distributed to distinct training aids, sections, and libraries. The first seven films in a series on gyro compasses, Mark 19 and 3, and Mark 23, are now available. Quote, Earth Rates shows how the Earth causes apparent rotation or movement of the gyroscope about its horizontal and vertical axis. The gyro, as a compass, describes the way in which gravity works, together with the principles of rigidity, precision, and earth rate to make a gyro compass out of the gyroscope." End quote. These wonderful scientific facts seem to be new to the modern scientist but they were known to the holy wise men of Melchizedek thousands of years ago. They built them and preserved them in stone in all their holy temples of prophecy. They conclusively prove that the heavens and the earth declare the glory of God and showeth his handiwork. I was provided these great scientific facts and principles for use in surveying and staking out the bounds of the original Garden of Eden, and in developing the evidence in absolute proof of the Bible account of creation and the location of the original Garden of Eden. Many people like to listen to the radio and to witness television programs. The greatest of all broadcasting and television stations is God, His power, His art, His music, his love, his life, and his wisdom are not limited. Why not tune in with a broadcasting station of unlimited power and a clear channel? You will then learn the meaning of teleology. The Garden of Eden and Two Creations The Bible does not state definitely where the Garden of Eden was located, where creation took place, or where the ark was built. Therefore, the mind of man has been confused as to where these great things were. The Encyclopedia Britannica says, quote, There are many speculations as to the site of the location of the Garden of Eden, and many think of it as an oasis in a barren desert. Then it dismisses the subject by stating that to try to locate a mythological garden would naturally be attended by great difficulty. Neither Jew nor Christian can accept this statement, for if the Bible account of creation and of the garden is a myth, then the Bible is a myth, and Christ is a myth. I was chosen and directed to uncover the evidence in absolute proof of the Bible account of purposeful creation and of the location of the Garden of Eden. In these pages, I shall give the reader sufficient information that if he cares to do so, 
he can satisfy himself beyond all doubt of the truthfulness of the Bible account of these things. At the time of creation, the continents were not so named, nor subdivided into political units, and though the Western Hemisphere was, without any question, the birthplace of man, and the site of the Garden of Eden, at the time the Bible was written, the people living in Asia, Europe, or Africa did not know that there is a continent west of the Atlantic Ocean. Not until Columbus discovered the Western Hemisphere some 464 years ago did they know the North and South America existed. But the Bible names certain definite natural monuments as being related to the Garden of Eden, and there is only one place on earth where those are found, and that is in the Apalachicola Valley of Bristol, Florida. The Bible names the natural monuments, such as every tree pleasant to the sight, the gopher wood trees, the river of foreheads, the numbering and the naming of the rivers according to the size and importance, the gold and the quality of the gold, and the bdellium and onyx stone in the area traversed by the first or Pison, Chattahoochee River, the skeletons and the works of the giants, as well as the things suggested by the little Garden of Eden, such as climate, water, natural beauty, and things that grow there. Names transplanted. There are certain names on the maps of Asia and Africa, such as Euphrates, Ethiopia, Havila, Assyria, etc., which have confused the thinking of the world as to the location of the Garden of Eden. But these names were transplanted to these areas after the flood. But the natural monuments mentioned in the Bible as being related to the Garden could not be transplanted. There was not any record of these natural monuments until the Bible was written, and the Bible was not written until thousands of years after creation. So, the natural inquiry is, how did such accurate information come to be incorporated in the Bible? The three things which interested man more than any others, down to the birth of Christ, were creation, the Garden of Eden, and the Flood. Because of their universal interest to all people, regardless of race, creed, or clime, the pertinent facts concerning each of them were preserved and handed down by word of mouth from generation to generation until the Bible was written and then incorporated in the Bible. These universal beliefs could not have been born of fiction. They are based upon facts. St. Luke, first chapter, first and second verses, tells us how great Bible facts were preserved. Since with God's help and under his direction, I have been enabled to uncover the natural monuments mentioned in the Bible. Jews and Christians have a basis of fact upon which to found their faith. Two Creations The Bible definitely teaches that there were two creations. The first creation was doubtless a long period of time, divided into which are called days. It is fully set out in the first chapter of Genesis, and one of the most beautiful and inspiring things the mind of man can reflect upon is the order of creation set out in the first chapter of Genesis. During the first period of creation, God created the heavens and the earth, the sun, the moon, and the stars, separated the waters, and dry land appeared, which was the Appalachian section of eastern United States, for all informed geologists admit that it is the oldest landmass on earth, the fishes of the sea and fowls of the air. Grass, herbs, and fruit trees 
only fruit trees during the first period. Beasts, cattle, and creeping things. Then male and female people. But they were created only as a pattern, likeness, or image, and were not given a soul or the power of choice, as was the Adamic man, created during the second period. Then God rested and watched the work of his hand. While he was resting, the Appalachian mountains eroded down, and the waters carried the refuse east, west, and south to form the plains and the Apalachicola Valley. Then God created again. He created the Adamic man, one mile east of Bristol, Florida, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and then gave him a soul, which is the power of choice, liberty, or the tree of life. He then created the Garden of Eden, just north of Bristol, and, quote, out of the ground caused to grow every tree pleasant to the sight, including the gopher wood trees. It is the only place on earth where the gopher wood trees grow, and the largest variety of trees are growing there of any place on earth. There are 28 trees mentioned in the Bible, and the largest number of them are growing there of any place on earth. God placed Adam in the Garden of Eden, just north of Bristol, to keep and tend it. But he soon saw that Adam was lonely, and he put him to sleep and took a rib from his side and created Mother Eve. Tree of Knowledge of Good and Evil He informed them that they could eat the fruit of any of the trees, except the fruit of the tree of good and evil. He made it plain to them, since he had given them liberty, that if they ate of that fruit, they would die as dependents and would have to get off of relief. After thinking the matter over carefully, and after talking with the serpent, or communist, not a snake, Mother Eve decided that she wanted her husband and her sons to be real men and not dependent weaklings. So she persuaded Adam to eat the fruit of knowledge of good and evil. God then drove Adam out of the garden, and Mother Eve without a doubt followed him out, and God placed at the east of the garden cherubims, guards, and a flaming sword to keep the way of the tree of life, the liberty of the individual. Certain individuals who love to engage in intellectual gymnastics have from time to time challenged the Bible account of purposeful creation, and the Garden of Eden, and the Flood. They deny that they believe in miracles, and yet, they say that they believe that blind, inorganic chemicals gave birth to life. They have tried to find a cross between two definite species, and they have sought in vain for the so-called missing link. They have pictured a bolt of lightning striking certain poison gases in space, thereby creating chemicals which resulted in protoplasm. They say that they can name the chemicals of life, but they cannot name the spark. River of Four Heads Genesis chapter 2, verse 10, says that a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and that it parted and had four heads. On the front page hereof, is shown a map of the only four-head river system in all the world. Until the U.S. engineers surveyed the Apalachicola, Chattahoochee, Flint River system, and then created the signboard showing the four-head river system, man had searched in vain the continents of Asia, Europe, and Africa for such a system. As stated, these river heads are numbered and named according to size and importance. Then astounding as the facts are, we have the gold and the quality of the gold. The Bedellium and Onyx Stone in North Georgia, where the Pison, or Chattahoochee, has its source as specifically mentioned in Genesis 
chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. The second of said rivers is the Gihon, and the Bible says that, quote, That is it that compasseth the land of Ethiopia. The Ethiopia that we now know is in Africa. If there had been a four-headed river system in Asia that watered the garden if it had been there, one of said rivers could not have possibly traversed and encompassed Ethiopia in Africa. The Ethiopia the Bible had in mind was a small independent community located about where Albany, Georgia is now situated, and the river that we know as the Flint was called Gihon before the flood. Because the ark rested on Mount Ararat, and because the names Euphrates, Assyria, and Havilah were transplanted after the flood to the continent of Asia, that continent was searched for thousands of years for the natural monuments mentioned in Genesis as being related to the garden. They did not know to look to the Apalachicola Valley. The Ark and Gopher Wood The Ark was built of gopher wood, selected by the Lord, because it is the lightest and toughest wood known. It grows in only one place on earth, and that is just north of Bristol, Florida. The Ark was built just north of Bristol, and pitched with pitch taken right there. After the earth was covered with water, fifteen cubits deep on the highest mountain, a cubit is twenty-one inches, it floated for one hundred and fifty days, or five months, from Bristol, Florida, to Mount Ararat in Asia, where it landed. The atmospheric drift caused by the rotation of the earth carried the ark from Bristol to Mount Ararat. Within the five months, it was afloat. Noah and his family did not know where they were, for there was not any way for them to know. They did not know that they had crossed the ocean and were on a different continent. They knew that they were not in their first home. They doubtless found it difficult to make a living. They continued to talk about the pleasant conditions of their original home, and to describe it and its attributes. They talked of the tree of life, the gopher trees, the river of four heads, the gold and the quality of the gold, and bdellium and onyx stone, along the Pison, or first river. They talked about the giants and their works. They and their posterity continued to talk and to describe the beauties and wonders of the Garden of Eden. Abraham and his people in Ur of Chaldea knew the description of the Garden of Eden, for it had been handed down to them by word of mouth from generation to generation. But they did not know its location. The Israelites in Egypt knew the description of the garden, but not its location. In fact, every nation and every people on earth had heard about the beautiful birthplace of mankind, and of the Garden of Eden, as they had about the flood. But they did not know the location, until, under God's direction, I uncovered the absolute facts concerning the location was anyone able to point out the location? That is why the Encyclopedia Britannica says that, quote, There are many speculations concerning the site of the location of the garden, and that many people think of it as an oasis in a barren region. The atheists and the communists have directed their greatest attack upon the Bible by attacking the account of creation and the garden. The Jewish and Christian churches, being unable to point out the location of the garden, and then prove it, had to apologize. They shall not have to apologize any longer. As further proof of the Bristol site of the building and loading of the ark, within the limestone formations of this area, are the fossilized bones, or parts of bones, of every animal 
known to have lived on this earth. As still further evidence of this location, verse 4, chapter 6 of Genesis says, There were giants in the earth in those days, and they were mighty men of renown. The skeletons and the works of such mighty men have been found in Florida, Alabama, North Carolina, New Mexico, Arizona, and other places in the United States, as well as in Old Mexico and Peru. And their temples and shrines antedate those found on any other continent. The Western Hemisphere was without a doubt the birthplace of man, and is really the Old World and not the New as has been believed. Place of Great Natural Beauty The garden is a place of great natural beauty. It is a shrine of deeper sentiment. It has been placed into a non-profit shrine forever. Whatever the public contributes to it, above upkeep and development, will be used to advance the religion, educational, recreational, and charitable betterment of mankind. In conclusion, I have been assisted by the exact scientific principles of teleology. It is sometimes mentioned by those who do not understand it as a mystic science. If astronomy, geology, astrology, energy, chemistry, gravity, earth rate, the principles of mathematics, love, mutations of the mind, and life itself are mysteries, then teleology is a mystery. The Bible says that the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament sheweth his handiwork. Those who delve into the glories of these great sciences marvel at the handiwork of God. And there is a definite key or alphabet of teleology, which enables one who has been provided the key to look beyond mechanical conceptions in his search for truth. God provides that key when he wants some special work done. Chapter 17 Conclusion I have decided to write this book in order that humanity may have the benefit of the many thousands of hours I have expended in research and study of the subject. I am personally convinced that man was created. To me there was nothing more important than to satisfy myself as to whether man was created or whether he evolved. Until the evolutionists can present more convincing facts that man evolved, I shall rest the facts and the conclusions herein, stated to the judgment of those who seek only the truth. Tradition is both a marvelous and a terrible thing. It is a chain and or a bridge that not only connects the past with the present, it is also a moving thing. When tradition is based upon truth, it helps to guide mankind into the enjoyment of truth. But when it is based upon falsehood or unproven assumption, it guides mankind into mental or spiritual confusion the conception that the original Garden of Eden was in Asia is a tradition founded in falsehood, and it has led man into spiritual confusion. It is my hope that the evidence which I have presented in this book will lead mankind to know the truth. As I have stated here, the Bible constitutes the field notes of the national monuments that are related to the Garden of Eden and the birthplace of man. These natural monuments are definitely described in the first eight chapters of Genesis. When and how they were described in the Bible, I do not positively know, and it is immaterial. But I have pointed out these very same natural monuments as are mentioned in the Bible. They do not exist and cannot be found at any other place on earth. They are, therefore, res ipsa loquitur. Many men have been executed 
on evidence not half so strong as this. The reader and his conscience can give such weight as he thinks it deserves.